Podcasting worldwide from a studio inside global headquarters of RP Enterprises in Kansas City. Kansas City. Hey, gang. Ladies and gentlemen. Papa's home. This is the Papa Ron Podcast. File transfer in progress. With Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Showtime. All right, welcome back. Episode 34 of the Papa Ron Podcast and brought to you by Brown Piercy Cattle Company. You know, Jillian, I got to tell you that I made a meatloaf the other day. You did? I did. I made a meatloaf. I'm not, you know, I like to do steaks and burgers and all those things, but yeah. I'm not usually a meatloaf guy. I tried a meatloaf and the recipe was not your mama's meatloaf. That's what it was called. My mom's is really good, though. You would want to have her. I would like to try that sometime. And so with the Brown Piercy Cattle Company's uh, hamburger, we did the not your mama's meatloaf. Instead, called it "It's Your Papa's Meatloaf." Ah, oh see what gosh. I did there? Oh ah. my gosh! <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Wait a minute. Another <laughs> another business venture on the way. Exactly. Right? Anyway, Brown Piercy <laughs> Cattle Company for years they've been breeding registered Angus cattle for generations with one thought in mind: quality beef for consumers. Their goal is to deliver prime graded beef directly to consumers' homes. More affordably than you can purchase them at the store. Better beef, uh, conveniently delivered at a lower price than the grocery store. Find them online, brownpiercycattle.com. We are uh, really excited to have this gentleman in studio for another episode of the Papa Ron Podcast. Um, I guess I'll start off by saying, just as a reminder, I, or maybe you're relatively new to the Papa Ron podcast. And so if you are, thank you for checking it out. In episode one, I uh, describe and explain how this Papa Ron podcast ever became a thing. And it was because I had a struggle with mental illness. Uh, gosh, that just still, just like, it's so hard to say even or admit even now after the many times that I've talked about it on this podcast. But um, I had a struggle and I had a friend challenge me to do the podcast. And um, it was... Um, an opportunity to find self-worth again. And it's a long story, but the short of the story is, is that now this podcast, while it was intended to be medicine for me, has become an opportunity to be medicine for many others through my testimony. And so through all of that, uh, Heartland Bowhunter and Heartland Waterfowl are having another Heartland Premier event coming up on June 17th with the uh, Charity Golf Classic, the Heartland Premier Charity Golf Classic on June 16th at Adams Point in Blue Springs. Last year, our beneficiary was Restoration House, now known as Rehope, where we raised almost over 20000 Actually, not almost. We did. We raised like $23,000 wow. for them. And uh, we were uh, looking at seeing who we could potentially partner with this year. Um, and uh, Sean and I have, um, I'm going to be careful what I say here. Sean has opened up to me about some of the struggles that he's had. I don't think that he would be too uncomfortable with, with me saying that, but I'll leave it at that. And, and so Sean and I talked about potentially finding an organization that yeah. would allow us to bring more awareness and uh, maybe provide even resources to those who are struggling with depression, anxiety, or maybe suicidal ideation, or just any of the many stresses that come with everyday life in today's society. So I reached out to Abundant Life, who is a church that Jillian and I attend, and Lee Summit, and uh, one of their people, uh, Jeff Cox, had uh, recommended that I speak to a guy by the name of John Thompson of Peace Partnership, who is our guest today in episode 34 of the Papa Ron Podcast. Welcome. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yay. Um, the cool thing uh, that right off the bat is we were kind of linked together, not only because of what you do with Peace Partnership, but you are a passionate hunter. Absolutely. I was <laughs> born and raised in Colorado, Western Colorado, and have hunted all my life. Mm. What do you, how old were you when you got started, do you think? Because Jillian's got kids and her husband, Matt, got them started turkey hunting at a really young age. Yep. Okay. So my birthday is January 5th and okay. I... I was, I have pictures of this. It is verifiable information. I was on my first hunting trip before one. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, my parents wow. introduced me to that. What kind of hunting? Yeah, El, uh, deer and elk. Deer and elk, yeah. Yep. Okay. Holy cow. Yeah. So, did, were, so was he doing like a spot and stock and you were on like in, in one of those, uh, what do you what do you call those, Jill, where they were the... Like a, it's like a backpack, but sometimes it's on the front. I don't know. There's probably a word for it. I don't know. Yeah. I never used I'm one. I'm really I, disappointed that you don't know this, man. No, I tried one and I was like, this this is too much. This, yeah. I'll just carry the baby. Yeah. So how did he bring your, how did they go on an elk hunt? Under I, the age of one. I think that mom just kind of kept me in camp, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> just okay. kind of corralled okay. in camp. Okay. But I can remember I have early, early uh, memories of hunting, and I just thoroughly enjoy it. Um, I got back, actually this year, got back from a great 
uh, hunt uh, with my dad. Uh, he's 72, uh, pulled uh-huh. a, uh, a, an elk tag, a bull elk tag for kind of a, oh, an exclusive unit, hmm. uh, in Colorado. Exclusive and, unit. I like how you worded that. Yeah. So it's not public yeah. land. Well, it is public land, but oh. it's a draw system. It's a lottery yeah. draw system. Oh, that there. kind of exclusive. So, gotcha. yeah. So gotcha. it took him about 12 years to get this tag. Holy so. moly. Wow. Yeah. And this was a, yeah. was this a firearm, muzzleloader, bow? First season rifle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and he he got one, mm. so it was it was great. Did, so. it, did he do it like first day? Was it one of those typical? It was on the last day in the final hour. <laughs> no, just uh, before dusk. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So when, okay, so we're just going to get into this like really quick. Okay, so <laughs> um, is this what the interview's about? Because yeah, I'm right. okay. Uh, so I this is this is really random information about a counselor, but uh, I really enjoy, and I got into it in my younger years out in Colorado. I really enjoy long range shooting. Okay, and so I do a lot of that. I have. Um, attended some matches uh, here locally. Um, oh, competitions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, PRS matches. Yeah, they're great, great uh, matches. And a lot of fun, great group of guys. So I've done a little bit of that, but I just really enjoy going out and shooting long range. And my dad called me when he got this tag and he you know, said, uh, uh, hey, so you, uh, you still do that long range shooting? Yeah, yeah, dad, I, I do. Um, you still have that, uh, that big elk rifle? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, but I still have that. Mm-hmm. Well, you'd sure be a good son if you brought that out to Colorado with you this season, you know? I was all like, okay, Dad, I got what it. What kind I of gun it. was it? Seven mag? Uh, it's a 300 Norma. Okay, okay, wow. So, yeah, kind of a 300 Winchester on steroids, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, and I got him all dialed in. I, again, I have video of this. Um, we found uh, a bull, located a bull that was, I think it was on about day three or four of a five-day hunt. Mm-hmm. And um, in the early morning uh, hours, he pulled the switch on it and got it. It was shot at 1,080. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Or holy bull in this case. Long, <laughs> long, long wow. shot. And yeah. he's how old? 72. I mean, it's a great gun. You're obviously a precision shooter, so you knew what you were doing. Um so do you, I forget what they call that because I'm not a long range guy, but do you have the uh, little tool that kind of judges like what your trajectory is and what the wind is? And then, you know, where to tell him to aim. Oh yeah. 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 I what was, is that called? What is that yeah. little device called? A Kestrel. Okay. Yeah. So there's a Kestrel that takes all of your atmospheric data, your barometric pressure. Oh wow. Um, all of that stuff gets, gets put into that. And then I was basically just tasked with getting him on target and making a first round hit. Yeah. Right. Uh, and yeah, he, he did it, but you still have to pull the trigger. Sure. Right? Sure. Just squeeze um, it. Yeah. No, so, and he did. And which, it which was amazing. He's got years of experience hunting. It's not like he yeah. doesn't know what he's doing. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Dad's an accomplished hunter. I learned uh, everything sure. I know from him. What did the bull score? So uh, it was not a very big bull. Uh, okay. He was, I, I would say he was probably high two hundreds. Okay. Probably. Okay. Um, it's respectable. Yeah. Yeah. But we, it was a great hunt. This is going to be his last uh, hunt. Uh, to, it was four, from our um, shooting location. It took us about four miles uh, hiking down into him. There's a thousand wow. vertical feet of elevation that we had to traverse, um, and it was it was an all is, day chore. <laughs> is he in pretty good shape for his age? I mean, how did how, how did he do? Great. Uh, great. Yeah. Now there's a couple times that he said, I'm not doing this again. I've had it. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he did a great job. Um, just, yeah, super impressive. That's mm. really cool that you got to experience that after all the years from under the age of one hunting with your dad and being out there with your mom and then him saying, I'm hanging my hat up after this to get to go and experience that with him, get, you know, content and get one. And get one. Yeah. Like yeah. what a special, special moment. I'm sure you got tons of still hero pictures with the bull. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. So let's talk more hunting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I could, I could do that with you all day anyway. So uh, I, I have to admit, I talked to Sean is also one of the guys, uh, Sean Luckdall, I'm speaking of from Heartland Bowhunter. He told me shortly after Jeff Cox of Abundant Life had said that we should talk to you. Apparently around that same time you had done or you were a speaker at we the people of jackson county missouri that's correct yeah and sean luchtel uh, attends that regularly and he reached out to me shortly after that and was like man you really got to have this john thompson on your podcast and i said man that is really weird like it's almost a god thing right like (laughs) i was just talking to jeff cox and he was suggesting i should have him on the on you know as uh, somebody who is a beneficiary for the premiere Hmm. so um I don't know much about your story other than what uh, your wife, Naomi had sent over kind of in a media kit um, other than, you know, that you were a uh, at risk teen 
That's mm-hmm. pretty much what I know. Mm-hmm. But Sean said that you had an incredible message and you were in, it was just a very fascinating story that you had to tell at we, the people of Jackson County. So, um, peace partnership, I guess let, we're going to get into your story, but peace partnership, let's, let's talk, let's start there because that's obviously what you're doing now, which is a great 501 C3 organization mm-hmm. helping out those who are less fortunate. Why don't you dive into that a little bit more? Okay. Uh, so peace partnership, uh, this June actually will be uh, 10 years for us. Congratulations. Uh, the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. we we'll, we feel very, very blessed to have been in business for that long and just helped, uh, thousands of people uh, at this point. And uh, I started Peace Partnership. Um, I had worked in a psychiatric hospital back in Colorado. That's kind of how I cut my teeth and got my start. Okay. Um, I've spent total about 20 years uh, in the industry, in the mental health industry. So I was a therapist, a crisis counselor at a, at a psychiatric hospital in the Denver area. And then we moved back here. Um, and people often ask, like, why in the world did you move from Colorado back to <laughs> you know the Midwest? Uh, and uh, it, it, the cost of living. Right. Okay. It was just really, really high hmm. uh, out there. And so we moved back here um, and I was a school counselor. Uh, the burnout rate in psychiatric hospitals is very high. Uh, and so it's just a super high stress um, job. OK. And it's I a, can see that. Yeah. It's about two years uh, is the is the that's the attrition rate. Uh, and I was two and a half. <laughs> um, and then I had had it and I wanted to do something a little bit more on the proactive side of things. And so I became a school counselor. Okay. Uh, and I was an elementary school counselor in Grain Valley, uh, worked for that school district for eight years and I loved my time there. I uh, had a great time and uh, was not really thinking about becoming an elementary school counselor. And it was actually at the behest of my mom uh, that I had spoken with her about it. And she said, yeah, she said, well, why don't you take it? And there's, you know, people shift around all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, So maybe you can become a high school counselor at some point in your career. I thought, okay. Um, Took it, loved it. Mm. Absolutely loved it. I worked for a wonderful uh, woman, uh, great, great lady. Uh, Kathy was her name and just fantastic boss. Learned a whole lot. But during my time there, I was constantly uh, conducting counseling sessions and then touching base with parents and saying, hey, um, it kind of be a good idea if your kiddo had some outside counseling, had some outside help. Okay. Uh, and then I would check back in with them. And the answer was the same uh, almost all the time. And that was, uh, John, yeah, I agree with you, but uh, counseling is just too expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just, we just cannot afford, uh, you know, well, the, the, the going rate now is anywhere between 125 and $150 a session. So, that becomes very problematic for a lot of families. And that's for how long a session, like 45 minutes, an hour typically. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. About 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and that's just kind of the going rate. So, uh, I, I, I became increasingly frustrated with that. Uh, and, and I remember one, at one point there was a grandmother uh, who was raising three of her grandkids and, uh, I had gone through the same spiel with her, you know, Hey, your kiddos could really benefit from some counseling. And then I followed up with her. And I kind of pressed a little bit on, well, this would really be beneficial for them. Uh, and she was a little bit of a, a gruff country gal. Uh, mm-hmm. And she just turned around and said, uh, John, if it's a choice between groceries or counseling, groceries is going to win that fight every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. I get uh, it. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, touche. You know, uh, well, yeah. you know, well said, point taken. Uh, and that's really what uh, those two professional events, the, the time in the psychiatric hospital, as well as my time in public education kind of uh, coalesced into this idea of what, what if people could attend counseling and they could pay what they could, not what they had to, Mm -hmm. Uh, would that be a good idea? Would, would generous minded people and organizations and businesses, would they get behind that? Um, and we were uh, attending, um, uh, Graceway at the time, and my wife and I, and um, our Sunday school teacher, we were really good friends uh, with him. And, uh, he's now the president of our uh, board, uh, Rick. And um, we went out and I pitched uh, my idea and it would just came about in the natural course of conversation. Um, mm-hmm. And he said, uh, yeah, we should do that. And I thought, what do you mean we should do that? Like, this is, you know, this is a lot of money to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to get this started. Yeah. Uh, and he said, well, we should, we should do that. Uh, can you find good counselors? Well, yeah. Uh, but there's a lot into that. And I had no idea, but, uh, Rick is a, a, a business owner. Uh, he's a very, very generous minded, uh, others focused individual. He's a mentor of mine, uh, and 
we're still friends, obviously, to this day. So it was a blessing to have Rick, who was a business owner, because typical business owners, entrepreneurs, they don't find reasons for failing. They find reasons for just jumping in and going. Like typically yes. those who are successful, they just take an idea and they go with it. And if you fail, you fail. But somebody who doesn't have that background might be a little bit more cautious because your mm -hmm. brain is trying to protect you for everything that could potentially go wrong. And that's what no disrespect to you, but that's where you were at. If oh. you wouldn't have had Rick, it may not have ever started. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I was tenured, right, with the district. So I'm on track to, you know, retire at 55 and, you know, be done. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, it was it was great. And Missouri retirement for public educators is one of the top in the nation. Uh, it, really? it's, it's They've got a great, great um, retirement, you know, program. But okay. yeah, I, I, I just really had this idea that, man, it would really be worthwhile if I could do this because what I have found uh, is that life is about different things for different people. And for me, uh, life is about finding a way. And I love to help people find a way. Uh, that is so I, cool. I just, I, I see things from a different perspective. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I can see a problem and I know that people have problems when they come in for counseling, but I don't see them as such. I should say, I see, a, I see a giant riddle, right? That I, okay, I can help this person with an aspect of this riddle in the next 50 minutes. And then the next week we can solve another aspect of this riddle. Uh, and that's just how I, that's just how I conceptualize it. That's just how I view it. Okay. Hmm. more about the, the, the organization. And because us, I, I was telling you before we started recording the pop around podcast is a separate entity to what I'm doing with Heartland Waterfowl and Heartland Bowhunter. But fortunately I do both. And, and we're going to be trying to use our uh, platforms as HB and HW to raise some money for peace partnership. And so at some point in this conversation, I want to dive into that and how Anybody who attends the premiere or attends the golf tournament, the money that would be going to Peace Partnership, how that would be beneficiary. But before we get into that, um, let's go back. Let's go back to your youth and and kind of talk about because again, as I read the media kit, you talked about being an at risk teen, and was it the troubles that you had along the way that that inspired you to get into what you're doing today? Yeah. So um, I. I would, I'm, I'm Irish. And okay. so uh, you look it, I kind of, yeah, I kind of, I kind of uh, come across, um, uh, being honorary, uh, pretty willingly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, I was just, um, I, I just was not going to be told what to do, uh, in my younger years. And that, as you can imagine, um, manifested itself in all sorts of ways. I was definitely in the drinking scene, the partying scene, uh, did a lot of that. Um, I was, uh, kicked out of my home um, oh, about halfway through my uh, senior year of high school. Uh, and so I was homeless for a little while. I lived with some friends, kind of couch surfed, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and it was uh, through the course of that uh, that I became a Christian. Um, because when you live that sort of a lifestyle, um, you just, quite frankly, you just, you, you see things and you experience things that um, are very, very awful. Mm -hmm. And during the course of that, I thought, okay, is this as good as life gets? Uh, is there nothing else? Um, and that's, that was, that was the beginning of a, of the turning point for me where I thought, okay, I have to find a way to live a better life. Um, going through uh, high school, I, you know, I ran around with kind of a, a, a tougher crowd and all throughout high school, I had friends either die or commit suicide. Mm -hmm. um, that was just kind of part and parcel of growing up. And, and at the time, you know, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so it was just a, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so committed suicide or so-and-so was, you know, stabbed at a party and died and, you know, mm. that kind of a thing. Mm. Uh, and so I thought, boy, there's gotta be, um, there's, there's got to be more to life than, you know, drinking and partying and, you know, all of that nonsense. Uh, and so that's really what kind of got me started. And I became, uh, became a Christian at 18. And one of the guys that, uh, I went to church, my mom and dad had always gone to church. It's just that I never really took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, I thought, well, I don't agree with everything that my mom and dad do, but 
I mean, there's, there's, there's no denying that they have a measurably better life than I do Mm -hmm. right at this point. So let's just kind of test the waters out and let's kind of see, well, maybe I can, you know, borrow some of their ideas and we'll just try them on for size and see how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, And, um, you know, it, it, it turns out that when you, you know, stop digging for bedrock and start climbing, things turn around in your life. (laughs) That's an interesting way to put it. Um, And so, yeah, I I tell clients now all the time, right, that if you find yourself in a pit, the first thing you should do is stop digging. Um, (laughs) I shouldn't laugh at that, but but I see the analogy. Yeah, like let's let's stop that first, okay? Um, And so, yeah, I kind of started to turn my life around and uh, the Thomas family, um, they, I, I had played some soccer with their son and, um, went to church and was friends with him. Paul was his name, Paul Thomas. And uh, his parents, uh, Keith and Jean, took me in. Uh, they knew that I didn't have a place to stay. And so they took me in and their old, they had three boys and their oldest son, Aaron, went to Calvary Bible College out here in Kansas City. Oh, wow. Uh, so this is in Grand Junction, Colorado at the time. Okay. okay. Yep. And that's the link with it. That's how I came out here. Huh. Uh, and so I came out here and went to uh, so college out here. You're 18 then. You came to Kansas City when you were 18. I came to Kansas City when I was 19. 19, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I came to Kansas City when I was 19. Uh, and I, I literally thought at the time, well, uh, if I'm going to be a Christian, uh, I might as well be a good one. Uh, and so... <laughs> I like, like that approach. Right, yeah. Very, very uh, straightforward and pragmatic, but uh, not a lot of thought for any future aspirations, <laughs> let's say that. Okay. Uh, and so I came out here to uh, Calvary because that's where Aaron was and... Mm-hmm. Um, drove out and thought, okay, cool. Um, yeah, this is, you know, kind of a, I needed a fresh start at the time. I'd burnt a lot of bridges. Uh, and so I thought, okay, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be a good thing for me. Uh, and it turned out that it was, uh, yeah, to say it was a good thing for me is an understatement. Mm. Uh, it was, it was the, the pivotal point looking back on it now at 47, uh, it was the pivotal point uh, in my life. Uh, that was a very, very gradual turning away from all of the nonsense and all of the uh, false beliefs that I held dear. Um, and uh, this idea is uh, is ubiquitous all throughout the Bible. Uh, it, in other words, it, it's all throughout the Old and the New Testament, this idea that, that there are parts of you that if you are going to become who God made you to be, there are parts of you that are not worthy to be you. And you need to rid yourself of those. And how it's it's stated in Scripture usually is in terms of a refiner's fire, um, <laughs> that that you get melted down. And we I, talked about Isaiah. this with Ryan Le, Ryan Lefevre mm-hmm. of the Royals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, it sounds like he he's we're reading the same thing or something. So same same concept that you know Isaiah talks about it that mm-hmm. I have um, you know tried you in the furnace of affliction. Right, it's that idea that that there's there's pieces of you that need burned away, and that process is painful, uh, and yeah. you you really have to you really have to you really have to want it. You, you have to be dedicated um, to the process of getting better, and that's what that's what Calvary did for me. Um, wow, uh, it was a very very uh, great experience. Uh, Jerry Provience was the dean at the time, and I did counseling with him uh, for several years. Uh, and just a great, great guy. I never saw Jerry coming. Now he was so slick. People see me coming in counseling. Um, <laughs> okay. But he was just, he was so slick and he would ask me, he would fit these little questions in uh, and you'd never see him coming. I remember one time he asked me, um, uh, I'd had kind of a, a strained relationship, obviously with my folks, with my parents. Sure. And uh, this is, I don't know, maybe six to eight months into counseling uh, with uh, Jerry and uh, we were talking and I was complaining about my mom, you know, like Freud said, right? If it's not one thing, it's your mother. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was talking about my mom. I'm complaining about her and all these awful things that she did and put me through and all these things. And he said, uh, John, um, can I just uh, interrupt you for a second? Well, what am I going to say? No. Right. Right. You know, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, um, it sounds like you're, you're going to start talking about your mom again. And I'm like, well, is the Pope Catholic? Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, of, of course, right? Like, she's the bane of my existence, right? Type of thing. Yeah. She's the problem. Um, she's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and and he said, uh, well, I'm just wondering if if I can ask you a question real quick. Oh, okay. When are you ever going to give up on the possibility of having a better past? Oh wow! Uh, 
Uh-oh. That hits you right between the eyes. Oh, man. Yeah, because I knew at once what he was asking. I knew at once what he was asking. I had this slick system worked out where everything that that was negative or bad that happened to me, well, that was clearly because of my folks, mm. right? But everything that was good that happened to me, oh, well, that was clearly because I overcame what my folks had done, <laughs> right? You're still 19 when you're experiencing yes. this? Okay. Yes. Uh, and so it was at that point that I realized that, that, you have to, I, I'm, I'm not, and I, I say this to clients all the time, I'm not asking you to stop blaming. I'm asking you to start blaming like an adult. Mm. And if you're going to blame your mom and dad or your, your husband or your wife or your kids or whoever, your boss, whatever the case might be, if you're going to blame them for the bad, you also have to blame them for the good. Mm. Uh, you can't, it, life is not so black and white. That's um, really good, and you, you you really have to do that. And again, that was part of that. That was part of that. You know, <laughs> refining process. Sure, sure, for me. I have this problem where I do these interviews and I get all of these questions, and so I like I feel like I have to spit out the question before I forget it, and then I completely just dominate over Jillian, and I don't give her a chance to ask any of her questions, and I see her down there just going to town taking notes. So I want to no, make sure okay. I, I was, give her an opportunity. Well, and part of while you were talking, I was like doing some math because I was like, I wonder how old he is. And he's at Calvary Bible College because I went to a um, youth retreat there. I can't remember what it was called. I know I got a t-shirt, but I don't still have the t-shirt. I was think it? it was called Yahweh. Uh, Kaya. Kaya. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I cannot re- believe I remembered that, but yeah. Kaya. <laughs> oh, I was so close. Uh, anyway. Wait a minute. Was that, is that close? What, what, what well, did you say originally? Yahweh. Yahweh and Kaya are close? <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> they sound nothing alike. Okay. So what does Kaya mean? <laughs> No, I do not know that. Uh, okay. I think that that there was is, meaning to it. yeah, that's either a Greek or, Greek or a Hebrew yeah. word that has some, yeah. I'm going to look it up while I'm talking. Okay. Anyway, so I was there and I was like, how old was I? Well, I wasn't old enough to drive yet, I don't think. So, but it, so doing the math, when you said how old you were, I'm like, well, you were probably there when I was there. Cause I went one time and I was either 14 or 15 cause I couldn't drive yet. Um, and I'm 43. Okay, how fascinating. So yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That, like, crazy. The, this one year that I went to this, it's so crazy. Okay. Kaya, I yeah, I, I was mm. there. Uh, I, I tell people that I crammed a four-year degree into seven. Uh, <laughs> I, I was there from uh, 1995 and I graduated in 02. And then I took about a year and a half off in the middle. Okay. There, so yeah. Wow. It's fascinating. Crazy. Small world. Mm-hmm. Huh. I want to go back to your childhood because on this particular podcast, I try to get to a point of vulnerability or I say we, I get, it's another problem I have. I say I so much. We try to get to a point of vulnerability where we want to pull back the curtain and dig a little deeper. Mm. So um, where did the problem start? I mean, you just kind of gave a surface level like, hey, well, I'm Irish. I was stubborn. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't really listen to my parents. Mm. You know, I can't imagine that you from the age of five, you know, you were just a problem child. At some point you had some sort of influence or you, did you get into substances or did you just run in a bad crowd? Did you have, was there a, was there a particular incident with your parents that really kind of, you know, triggered it all? What, where did it all start? So, uh, and this is another thing that I, I talk to um, clients about a lot uh, as especially parents. Be careful about curbing your child's stubbornness. Stubbornness can be very, very valuable, and it can be very, very useful in the right context. Okay. If, if you learn to kind of form it and shape it and, and have it work for you. And from an early age, and my mom would say this, um, from an early age, uh, I was going to do it my way. Uh, I, so you were, ver- you were very dependent. I, or independent, rather. Very independent. Uh, and I, I do a lot of reading, and I read a lot of old books, and the reason that I read a lot of old books is because I, in my opinion, uh, I think that uh, old books have stood the test of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I'm not necessarily really interested in what a lot of, you know, pop psychologists, you know, say, but I am very interested in what some of the greatest minds who've ever lived have to say. Okay. Uh, very interested about that. Um, because... Books can, and I'll, I'll answer your question here in just a second. You're fine, so, you're fine. Okay, um, uh, books can be thought of uh, as kind of uh, layers, right? So if you know the source layer, then you don't have to know all of the other layers that gain their wisdom from the source. 
Okay. If that makes sense, right? So in other words, a lot of books out there reference the Bible. Well, wouldn't it be good if you knew the Bible? Mm-hmm. <laughs> good point. Yeah. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's that yeah. sort that sort of an idea. Okay. Um, a lot of of writers will reference uh, Dostoevsky, uh, or they'll reference uh, a man by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote a uh, fascinating book called the the uh, Gulag Archipelago. Uh, it's actually a three volume uh, book that's just dark, and it's about his twelve years uh, in the Russian concentration camps, the Gulags. Um, what year would that? Uh, that would have been, have come out. he was, that was right after uh, World War II. Uh, he was, he actually was in the Red Army uh, and helped liberate Germany. And then uh, they, you know, because everybody in, you know, communism is a conspirator. Uh, <laughs> and they threw him into uh, the, the gulags because of it. Uh, wow. Yeah. Accused him of, esp- or, you know, espionage or spying or something yeah, yeah. like that. Mm, so, yeah. Wow. Um, so I, I read a lot of that material and that's what I'm, I'm primarily concerned with. And one of the guys who's a, a Greek philosopher, uh, Epictetus, he wrote something that was, uh, is very, very um, apropos to my situation uh, when I was younger. And that is, he said that human beings can learn by three methods. Uh, we can learn through imitation, we can learn through observation, and we can learn through experience. And he drew the conclusion that experience is the most bitter way to learn. Hmm. And so if you can learn through imitation and observation, you are exercising wisdom, which wisdom, a good working definition of wisdom would be skill in living. Like you figured some things out that other people just haven't. And because you figured that out, your life is going well. Okay. Right? Um, that if you can, if you can imitate people and if you can observe people and then draw conclusions, actionable conclusions from that, it's much, much better than to just think like, well, I'm just going to plow ahead and I'm just going to experience all of these things and I'm going to do it my own way. Right. Okay. Uh, well, when I was younger, oh, I was going to do it my own way. <laughs> and <laughs> it was uh, experience it, or nothing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. as it turns out, that's a very bitter way to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but there have to be people like you that learn that way for other people to observe, learn by observance and, maybe not imitation if it's that you're learning something the hard way, but it's like, it's like how, or I, I want my kids to like selfishly, but selfishly for them. I'm like, I don't want them to learn the hard way. I don't Mm. want them to make these make bad choices and Mm. learn from experience, even though we know that you have to somewhat, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, I want them to see other people experience something and go, I don't want to do that. I want to do it differently or see it, a good thing. And that's how I want to do it. But that's not always, I mean, you can't right. like, well, and I think it's no inevitable that we're all going to at some point in time in our life, learn something the hard way. Yes. Yeah, for yes. sure. Yes. And so the, the trick is uh, for, for the, for the parent anyway, uh, the, the trick is, is that you want your child to learn those things when the price tag associated with the behavior is relatively small mm-hmm. so that they get that, that experience, mm-hmm. you know, learning kind of out of their system. Like, Ooh, wow. That, really <laughs> there were some serious consequences associated with that so so so, th- so so i'm guessing what you what you could be meaning by that is you hear stories about kids that have no, basically no opportunity to make mistakes until they leave the house mm-hmm. you know until they're 18 or until they're whatever time they're they leave considered sheltered the, mm-hmm. right and not that you don't shouldn't have rules at home and have consequences for things if you break the rules and that kind of thing but i feel like we I saw it a lot in friends of mine that um, when I was growing up that they finally got to leave and get out on their own. And then they just went absolutely crazy Oh yeah, because they could. And so then the consequences or the prices are higher than yes. with no, nobody to come back to because a lot of times they couldn't go back home. Yes. They couldn't go back to their parents for even if it was like, Oh, I really messed up and uh, you know, just for comfort or yeah bail them out, whatever that looked like, whether that was actually bailing them out of jail or, or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. Or you know, just shame, bad, you know, that they yeah. didn't want their parents to see how bad they screwed up. And right. It was this, yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's a key component of it is that, you know, we need to learn these things, but we don't need to learn them when the price tag associated with them is so sky high mm-hmm. that it can just be life changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, learn it, you know, learn it when you're young. And it's really fascinating that, um, yeah, we're, we're, 
our, our, our culture is becoming more and more attuned to raising kids in this environment of uh, just comfort and convenience. Uh, and, you know, we don't, we don't bow down before, you know, stone gods, you know, anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're right. much more advanced than that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> but we do bow down before comfort and convenience. That's our God today. Yeah, mm-hmm. seems um, like it. And so it's, it's saying, no, 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 no. We're going to be, as parents, we're going to be very intentional about stepping away from that uh, and giving uh, kids the necessary resistance in life right. that helps them develop that character. Right. I see it in parents and it's, this is, these are not big consequences, not big prices, but I'll see parents of little kids that, this is just an example, they maybe take them to church for a special service or for a funeral or for a wedding, and maybe they've never sat, and I'm, that's not even like, a, oh, you don't go to church regularly, but they've never been made to sit still and be quiet mm-hmm. just because it's yeah. the respectful thing to do mm-hmm. without having a tablet in their hand. Like, they don't have to sit at a restaurant and just behave and do what you're supposed, and observe, observe that, oh, when we're at the table at a restaurant, we just talk and visit and maybe you get to color or draw, mm-hmm. but to have to have something all the time that you're glued to, well then that at some point that's not going to work anymore. Mm-hmm. And so then mm-hmm. if you're constantly like entertaining to keep them from disrupting or doing something, well then at some point in their life, they're going to have to, they're not going to get to have a tablet in their hand mm-hmm. and they're going to have to know how to act. And then that's going to look weird when they're, whatever age and they can't No, you're right. do what they need to do in a given situation. Does that make you, sense? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And that and, could even be yeah. like out of high school and into college and, or, or out on the job force, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, my kids will come home and be like, Oh, I had to do a project and so-and-so and they were so annoying. And, and no, I was doing most of the work. You know, I'm like, that's life. Welcome yeah. to it. That's yeah. life. That, it's going to be that way your whole life. You're going yeah. to work with someone who's difficult or you're going to be the difficult person for someone else or what? Like that's, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's just life. That's Absolutely. Yeah. There is a great uh, book. Out, this is a, a sh- shameless plug for a random book. Um, <laughs> great book out there. And this, this is a recent uh, book. So here I am being a hypocrite saying like, oh, I, well, I read <laughs> old <laughs> books. <laughs> old books. And, well, I just read a lot. Let me yeah, just say that. Yeah. Uh, but it's a book called Glow Kids, G-L-O-W, okay. uh, Glow Kids, a great, great book. And it is on um, technology and screen addiction. Mm. Really, really good book. Uh, I would I I recommend, to that. That to, yeah, mm. ec- recommend that to anybody who will listen to me. I think it's probably the most clinically significant book that I've read in the past 10 years. Wow. Oh, wow. That's saying yeah. something. Yes, really, Especially really. Especially somebody who reads as much as you do. Very, very uh, significant. He actually did his PhD work on screen addiction. He has a huge clinic up in New York state and fascinating, fascinating findings. Here's just a a little tidbit of information. Uh, A lot of big time uh, Silicon Valley execs that work for Yahoo and Google and Microsoft, all these Mm -hmm. things, they send their own kids to very elite Waldorf schools in Palo Alto, California, Hmm. and they are not low tech schools. They're no tech schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's that tell you? So yeah, very, very <laughs> interesting that, you know, there all these executives are, are pushing yeah. all kinds of technology right. uh, onto, onto, onto public education, but yeah. then with their own, oh yeah. no, 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 it's not low tech, it's no tech. No tech. Yeah. And that's- That kind of that's just thing. made my stomach churn a little bit. I, I mean, that I, mean, I, I guess I'm really surprised to hear that. And it almost sounds like a drug dealer who doesn't want to give their kids drugs. Yeah. You know, like, Hey, it's good for everybody else, but don't, but don't let my family or anybody I love have it. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating book and you'll read through it. I mean, I, I think I read through it in what, two days. Uh, it's a fascinating read. I got to admit, and, and I'm just being raw and I hope that my wife probably, <laughs> she's probably going to kill me for saying this, but we are that those parents that are, um, God, just it's cringing me to say it, that lets our kids spend way too much time in front of the screen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's It's easy to do. It is. It it absolutely is. And so what I tell parents is this, as I go around and I, I, because I do quite a bit of public speaking too. And so what I uh, tell parents is this, don't view technology in terms of right or wrong, Mm -hmm. view it in terms of power. You would never give a 16-year-old who just got their license a Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Why would you not do that? Well, yeah. it's got an 800-horsepower engine. 
Church. And <laughs> like they're going to get in trouble with it. It's yeah. just too powerful. Mm-hmm. Technology is the same way. Uh, we have a supercomputer in our pocket. Yeah. And so it, they, they need to be managed on it. They need all of that. And there's, again, there's a lot of research and it's cited in that glow kids book. uh, But there's a lot of research out there that points to exactly that people in my field, a lot of top minds uh, in the fields of psychology and psychiatry uh, are being siphoned off and not going into the trenches and actually helping people, but they're going to work for video game companies. And as video games will be in their development stages, then they will have certain psychological benchmarks like heart rate, blood pressure, all these different types of things Mm -hmm. that they want study participants to hit while they're playing the game. And if they don't, oh yeah. And if they don't, it's back to the drawing board. They want you playing their game 24 seven. Um, the executive of Netflix, or the former executive of Netflix, I think, um, it was quoted as saying that our only competition is time. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or sleep. I think he said our only competition is sleep. Makes sense. Right? Wow. So, yeah. It's, so, it's, whoever invented that little thing on Netflix that is like, goes just goes to the next episode, it doesn't really give you a choice. I mean, you do have a choice. You can turn it off. Yeah. But, I mean, how brilliant, like, whoever. Or YouTube is the same way. Yeah, right. That the yep. next, the yep. next thing, it just, it just comes. It's yes. just going to come, and it's, and, and then knowing what you like to watch and yes, and that's building be, off of that. They're, they're, what, and what Brilliant. they're doing is they're they're playing off of human psychology because sure. the brain is, in one sense, it can be thought of as a binary machine, right? It only thinks in ones and zeros. It only wants the dopamine hit. It does not think in terms of context. Okay, that's why people get. Um, in all kinds of trouble uh, in terms of like, uh, well, there's two different types of addictions. There's process addictions and ingestive addictions. Uh, Ingestive addictions are things that you take, things that you ingest, Mm -hmm. uh, drugs, alcohol, that kind of thing. Okay. And then process addictions would be pornography, gambling, things that you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a little side note. Okay. But what's that called again? (laughs) Prog. Uh, process addiction. Process addiction. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So process addictions and ingestive addictions, and they're playing off of uh, our current understanding of addictive tendencies. Is that the brain does not think in context. The brain doesn't think, "Hey, uh, yeah, it, this makes us feel good, but it's also destroying our life." Hmm. Well, it doesn't think that way. Mm. It just thinks like, "Hey, I want the dopamine hit." Yeah, that's dopamine. it. That damn dopamine. I know, right? <laughs> that damn dopamine. I mean, who doesn't get a, at some point? I mean, we've it, maybe this isn't fair to say, but I've definitely been a guilty of the dopamine that mm. you get on social media, mm-hmm. you know, and, and seeing like it was maybe more so back when, you know, I first got involved with it. Like you put some content out there, like who's commenting on it or you're putting it out there so you can get it commented or you want to put something out there about politics because you want to get into a pissing match. I was terrible at that. Terrible. I mean, I did it for just to poke the bear more, you know, but it was the dopamine. It was like, Oh, who can I get in a, in a, a spat with who's, who's liking all of my content. Who's, you know, like that's getting dopamine. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I did not expect yeah. this conversation to go down this road, but I'm glad we did. Um, and, and let me just also clarify, because I'm starting to get an anxiety attack, that my <laughs> wife does actually from time to time say, you're not going to spend your entire day on the phone. You're going to go play with your toys or go mm-hmm. outside. You know, So she's going to say, well, don't put me in that circle. But um, you know, the thing that I find uh, with, with the whole technology and the kids is, is that it's sometimes like just take your phone Mm. and give me a break, Mm -hmm. you know? And if I could just get some peace and quiet and if he's on his phone, he's quiet, he's engaged. Mm -hmm. And like those stuff he's watching is blippy, Mm -hmm. you know, or YouTube kids or stuff. And the one thing I've, and I'm not trying to make an excuse for what you're saying um, because I think it's all very valid, but I have found from even my daughter, because she was that person who would watch the YouTube content or the PBS kids and stuff like there's some educational stuff that you can get from that that helps you intellectually. Sure, sure, Can absolutely. you speak on that, you know, so that we all parents that use technology with their kids <laughs> don't feel like that we're sending them down the road of failure? Yeah, Well, no. even Blippy though, is educational. Like, yeah, I mean, no, for sure. Like, it's fascinating. If I don't know if you've ever 
watch Blippi. Do you know Blippi? I do not know Blippi. Okay. No, yeah. You should. No. He dresses like you guys. Anyway, I'm joking. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Well, he dresses ridiculously because he's He acts to little, ridiculously. To little kids, right? Like, okay. he, you know, he wears like a, a beanie and suspenders, bright colors. But what I think is cool about him, and I haven't watched him a lot, my niece kind of went through a phase a while back, but from what I could tell, it reminded me of a a little bit of a modern day Mr. Rogers. And I love Mr. Rogers. Oh, that's a like, really good analogy. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. I just yeah. like, I wish I could have met Mr. Rogers because it was ingenious. Like if you've ever seen the documentary or the movie about him, that he just did normal everyday things. Mm. And he's like, that's kids need to see that. Some kids in their home don't like and on his show, you know, he had a fish tank and he fed the fish every day. Mm -hmm. And he's like, some kids don't have that. Yeah. Some kids don't have that, like someone else depending on them and the responsibility that it is to feed the fish every day because the fish can't feed itself. And, and I think he said one day on, on a show, he forgot, he was walking by the fish tank and forgot to feed the fish. And he said, you wouldn't believe, and this was back before, like email and stuff, you know, we got so many letters from kids who were concerned that we for, I forgot to feed the fish. And he said, it was just fascinating that the small things that like kids notice. Mm. And so Blippi kind of does this, like, you know, it might be that they're going to go, it's something very normal. Like he might, I don't know, it might not be a copy machine, but there's a copy machine in front of us. So it might be like, let's see how a copy machine works mm -hmm. or let's see how a bulldozer works. And then yeah. it's just the very like basic whatever that, Maybe some kids already know that, but mm. maybe some don't, yeah. you know? Mm. So anyway, sorry. I know I no. hijacked that question, but no, no. Flippy's I, impressive to me. I guess where I was ultimately annoying. saying is, is that I think that I could probably do better as a father to, um, and it, maybe it's just laziness on my part. I don't like, I think I'm a lazy dad, but I think that there are times where I'm just exhausted Yeah, mm. and you know, I could, I'm well, older yeah. it's harder to get up and off the floor to play with Tonka toys, you know? And right, so like the thought of like, just, uh, watch your phone for a little bit, getting mm -hmm. out a craft project. Like, mm -hmm. can we draw or can we get out the markers or the paint or like my kids always wanted to paint. And I'd be like, Oh, I know oh, painting. Reagan oh, always wants God. to make slime. And I'm like, Oh, do we have to make this such a mess? I know. Right. <laughs> like the mess is just like, Oh my gosh, do we have to make a mess today? John, you know? do you have yeah. kids? I guess we need to, have you experienced any of this? I know. I okay. do not have kids. I, I I'm Naomi. sure we're giving you reasons not to have yeah. any now. <laughs> no, that that was a that was a very intentional early on decision uh, okay. that I made uh, because I knew that mm -hmm. um, I I knew that I had found my calling mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in counseling. I knew okay. that this is what I wanted to do, um, but I also knew that I I am I am uh, I'm I'm not a moderation guy. <laughs> unfortunately, okay, uh, I am I'm all in or I'm all out. Um, and so I knew I was going to be doing, doing this. that and try to do the balance with a family. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yes. I can imagine that was, that was really smart of you to, uh, to th premeditate that yeah. or just doing it. Yes. And one of the, one of the things I do, so I kind of have two things going on professionally. So I'm the executive director of peace partnership from eight to five. And then I'm also, I I've got a little side gig, uh, which is a counseling a okay. uh, little LLC, uh, Genesis counseling. Okay. And so I do that for people that do not fit, uh, peace partnerships, financial model. Okay. So okay. it's just fee for service, just people that can come in and, and mm -hmm. they can afford to pay. And you do that every night. I do that every night. And so my average work week, I work four 11 hour days, Monday through Thursday. I work an eight hour day, Friday, and I'll routinely teach on Saturday and or Sunday. And I've just done that. How are for, you still married? Well, I work with my wife. So, Oh, is she in the same profession? I mean, I know that she, she yes. helps out, but I didn't know that she was a counselor also. Well, she's not a counselor, oh. but she is the uh, director of development for Peace Partnership. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But then you say you work with your wife every day. Then I also say, how are you still married? <laughs> no, <laughs> good point. no, like no disrespect. No. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And That's we, amazing. we had a, we really had some, um, <laughs> some serious conversations about, okay, uh, this is either going to be a good thing or we're going to get a divorce. Yeah. And so let's avoid the divorce. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we really had to have a heart to heart conversation. It's like, okay, if we're going to start working together, we have to be open and vulnerable and honest with one another in terms of, is this working? Mm -hmm. And that was nine years ago. Okay. Um, so yeah. My question a while back was how you got to be that at risk kid, you know, mm -hmm. like that. And then we kind of got, went on yeah. this down this road. So are you comfortable kind of telling your story in, in, in all the trials and tribulations that you had? I think what you're ultimately just saying was, is that you were that kid 
who, um, you know, was going to do it your way. And basically your mother maybe had had difficulty understanding that. And, and not that she's a bad mom. I'm sure you love your mom and you have a great you relationship. Bet. I'm you not bet. trying to speak disparagingly against her. She just only knew what she knew mm -hmm. and the two didn't mesh. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all kind of started. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely fair to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, we grew up, uh, you know, mom and dad, uh, did the best they could, but we were definitely kind of on the maybe lower middle class kind of okay. rode that poverty line, um, right there. Mom and dad, lots of times they were working two jobs, uh, sometimes three. And I, you know, vividly remember that. Uh, and they, mom and dad, again, did a great job, but that was just part of growing up. You just, just knew what you knew. Yeah. That was just part of life. So let's dive into your personal life a little bit You're when we come to the Oops, wrong button. We're going to dive into your personal life here in a little bit. Um, when we come back from the break because I want to get to know you a little bit better. I think that there are probably parents out there who are trying to understand like, what, what am I doing wrong? You know, and, and maybe your story, your testimony might bring some awareness to them. So let's talk about that. When we come back, it's episode 34 with John Thompson on the Papa Ron podcast. You're listening to the Papa Ron podcast to contact us with questions, comments, or interest in sponsoring the show. Find us online at paparonradio.com. Downloading. Now back to the show. Here again are your hosts, Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gregg. I'd also like to remind you to check out heartlandbowhunter.com. You can also check out, check out heartlandwaterfowl.com. But there at heartlandbowhunter.com, you're going to find information about the Heartland premiere event that is coming up on June 17th at the Stony Creek Hotel and Convention Center or Conference Center. I can't remember if it's convention or conference, but it's the same thing. And then we're going to have our second annual charity golf classic at Adams Point and Blue Springs that Friday, June 16th. And that uh, charity golf tournament, again, is to benefit Peace Partnership, uh, which is what, what we're talking about here today with John Thompson, who's the executive director in studio with us. So um, before we went to break, talking about uh, your childhood, you found out at an early age that you were kind of a I'm going to do it my way type of guy that didn't sit well with your mom. And then did it just kind of spiral year after year after that? Did you end up... Uh, you said you got kicked out. So at some point they just got sick and tired of being sick and tired and booted you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Was there something significant that happened that took him to that level? I mean, how bad were you really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, it, it depends on what school administrator you ask. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it really kind of started uh, in middle school for me. And I definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I definitely would have been, diagnosed with kind of a, that conduct disorder, um, very, very just kind of antisocial, did not care, uh, what other people thought I was going to be the class clown. I was going to have fun. Um, I was going to like, if I not, not uncommon at all, go to school, just absolutely drunk, could barely walk. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, that was not uncommon in high school. Um, so, but it, it kind of started back in middle school just with really, bad friends and bad choices. Okay. Uh, and that's really kind of where it, it started. And I already had that propensity just to kind of be on the wild side. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's one of the, again, it's one of those things that, that, you know, you, you just have to, you have to learn to manage. Uh, and that's, like I said earlier, it's not necessarily a bad thing if people are stubborn, but it's what you're stubborn for. Why are you stubborn for all the wrong things, John? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it was that idea. Okay. Uh, and uh, early on, I, I got, um, oh, they, they do IQ testing for lots of kids, and I qualified for the gifted program, and evidently I was really smart and just bored. Uh, and mm. so for, for kids, uh, especially young boys, if you're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, and you're required to sit in a classroom for, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day. Uh, it's hell. Mm -hmm. It's just torture. Yeah. It's absolutely torture. And then they say like, well, your kid probably might have ADHD or something like that. No, they, 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 they don't. 
They don't. Right. You know what they have? There's a, yeah, it seems you like any more in today's society, it's uh, like, well, if there's a problem, then now they got to diagnose it with some sort of new term. We're like, right. we never talked about ADHD or OCD or any of this stuff when we were, not that, not that those aren't real things, but sure. don't, aren't they overly diagnosed anymore oh. in today's society? We didn't yes. know anything yes. about this when I was a kid growing up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the reason for that, the reason that they're overdiagnosed uh, is because the majority of diagnoses are brought on by teachers. And teachers, again, they, they don't, they're not trying to do this. It's not like they're meeting in some darkly lit room and they're, you know, conspiring against <laughs> Let's kids. Let's try to get seven not kids all of them diagnosed anyway. today. Exactly, <laughs> right. There's this secret Illuminati of <laughs> right. teachers. You Rewards know. program, they got a punch card. <laughs> get two yeah, more today. Yeah, no, yeah. it's not how it works. Yeah, get 10 diagnosed, get one free, you know. Um, I wouldn't doubt it in a COVID world that we had. Well, you know, anyway, yeah. I digress. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. I went yeah. down another rabbit hole. The, anyway, the, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so... A lot of teachers, because they are overworked and because they have huge class sizes, you know, 25, 27, 30 kids in a classroom, a lot of ADHD diagnoses in the United States are made by teachers, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right now, teachers, it's kind of, they kind of have a slick system worked out because you, as an educator, you cannot say point blank, hey, I think you should have your kid tested for this because then you, you, the school district is then on the hook financially to have that testing done. Oh. So they, they're very That's careful. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, they're very careful in how they word things. But ultimately, about 80%, about eight out of every 10 ADHD referrals come from teachers. And it's for the sole purpose of compliance in the classroom. That's what it's for. Yeah. Uh, and that, in my mind, that's a problem. That yeah. is a huge problem. That's a problem. Why are we continuing to do things like kids come off of a conveyor belt? We're continuing to educate people like they come off of a conveyor belt, and they don't. But we continue to do that. The same kinds of things, and this, again, this is not saying that all teachers are doing anything wrong or all school districts are doing things wrong, and so what I'm going to compare it to is not saying this about doctors either, but the same kinds of things happen that mm. like mm. in general, they're going to make general, well, this is the symptom. This is the symptom. This must be what it is. Here's the medicine that works for it. Let's just do that because then that like kind of cookie cutter ish, mm -hmm. not that all doctors, I'm not saying they're not all that way. Um, but I think that's, that's a similar, oh, a yeah. similar thing of the, well, yeah. this, this will fix it. Yes. Well, it will, <laughs> yeah. it will control the behavior, whatever that medication is. Yes. For yeah. that, and maybe mask mm -hmm. some of the whatever it is. Yeah, it slaps a bandaid on it, really. Yeah, yeah, and that's a lot of that is a lot of the problem right there. Is mm -hmm. that there's a lot of kids who are just over medicated, and the, the my question is, and this I I go through this in counseling with almost every single client that I have, is that you begin with the end in mind. So we're not going to begin something unless we can trace it out and see where our strategy takes us. Strategy is about movement. Tactics are is about the individual steps that you take along the way to get where you need to go to achieve that strategy. So, well, my, my kid, you know, is ADHD, you know, um, I, I might need to take him to the hospital or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Isn't it fascinating that we see a lot of kids that get diagnosed and get on ADHD medication and none of them get off? Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Mm -hmm. Right? Like that's problematic. If I have a headache, I take ibuprofen or I take Tylenol and when my headache goes away, I don't continue to take it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So again, I think it, I think that it's, it's problematic in psychiatry. Um, I, I, last time I heard, I think this was in 2019, I read this, that uh, or the, the study was from 2019, about eight out of every 10 current psychiatry students specialize in psychopharmacology. Hmm. Well, that's the only thing they're going to make money at. And the mm -hmm. going rate is about 250 to $300 to meet with a psychiatrist. And that meeting is 15 minutes. And so, <laughs> wow. yeah, so that's, that again, just pisses me off. Yeah. It, it, they're not, it really does. Yeah. It does me too, because they're not, they're not taking the time to figure out what's really going on. I literally have a booklet. Now, it's from the DSM-4, okay? And the, the, the DSM is the Diagnostic of, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, okay? So it's okay. kind of like uh, the mental health's Bible, so mm -hmm. to speak, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a DSM-5 now, and uh, 
now they're just recently they have come out with the DSM five TR, which is TR just stands for text revision. Okay, mm. so it's kind of like an updated version. Sure. Well, in the DSM four, I have a little booklet that is on my bookshelf in my office that is a list of questions that you would ask in a screening process to see if people struggle with any kind of these mental health issues, these mental illnesses. Mm. And that's basically what they go through in psychiatry office. Do you feel this? How often do you feel this? Mm. Uh, what frequency is it? What's the intensity on a scale of one to 10? And then presto, boom. Yep. Here's your script. Off you go. So then this may be veering off. We keep doing that. What do you recommend? Because the the other way that's similar in someone on the parent side of it, right? As a parent, I feel like I should trust my doctor, right? Mm. I feel like I should trust my teach my kid's teacher yep. or my kid's counselor who's maybe getting the referral from the teacher. It goes, I don't know if that's the process, it goes to the counselor, the count, I don't know. But you're you're like, well, these are the people that are I'm trusting and this is what they say I should do. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? Mm-hmm. And to that, I would say um, people, people give over too much trust to people like me. Uh, if, I, if I'm just going to be very frank with you. Yeah, I wanted to bring that in. Yeah. I want you to be able to elaborate on her question. But the thing that kind of began repeating itself in my mind when you were explaining all of this was like you worked in the public school system. Mm -hmm. And it almost sounds like that there's this narrative that's kind of being pushed through public school system. And please, because you worked in the system, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you know, I've, this isn't the only issue that I've kind of got with the public school system these days. And the, just the kind of walk that we're seeing as the progression continues year to year. How did you take the knowledge that you had, the experience that you have, and how was it received when you were, you know, talking to administrators, school board members, whatever it might be on how they were handling certain issues like you were speaking of earlier? Well, basically, um, it, 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 it varies from school district to school district. And even within that district, it varies from school to school. So you might have a district that really, uh, you know, the general idea or the general ethos of the of the district is that it's just not very good. But you might have a couple of isolated schools within that district that are great. Mm. Okay, so did you have any issues in Grain Valley? No, Grain Valley, by and large, was a great uh, school district. And I was at Matthews Elementary, and yeah, I loved my time there. Okay. Um, absolutely loved it. But that was because I had a good administrator. Okay. <laughs> sure. At the time. Sure. And then when that changes, everything else changes. Sure. So getting then back to Jill's question then is to not put too much trust into people like you. What do, what does a parent look for then? How does the parent stay aware or stay on top of things when you're just putting your heart and you know, you're, 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 you're you gotta have some faith. You don't want to send your kids to a school thing. Like, Man, I got to babysit this thing and I got to be aware and what they're talking to them about because, or just be like, you don't want, I don't know. I don't mean to put like fear in someone listening. That's like, maybe they've been told something or diagnosed something. And go, well, can I not trust that one? And then be skeptical of everything. But I think right. there's a healthy level of skepticism too, of like, well, if this, this is the process, mm -hmm. but what could also be a contributing factor, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I think that's whether you're talking about physical health or mental health, I think, and maybe, I, I don't know, maybe this is just not super mainstream, but there can be so many other factors. There mm -hmm. can be environmental factors. There can be um, something that's diet related that can affect obviously mm -hmm. your physical health. Actually, but, that's but a big thing. Mental mm -hmm. health, you know, so I, so yeah, still back to the, what, what are you supposed to do as a parent? If, mm -hmm. if you're getting referred to a psychiatrist, and you're like, well, it's going to cost me $300 and they're going to be in there 12 minutes, but I'm just going to be like, okay, I'll mm -hmm. do that. <laughs> I'll take that prescription. Yeah. Give my kid that. And to that, I would say, uh, do not <clears throat> talking to people who are in the mental health profession, uh, in my opinion, is kind of like trying on a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you might need to try a couple on before mm -hmm. you find a good fit. Mm -hmm. And so I would, if it was, if I had a child and it was my child and they got a referral for ADHD and or, or whatever, mm -hmm. depression, sure. Sure. you know, um, and I took them to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist really didn't spend any time with them at all. That is an automatic red flag for me as a parent. you you, you're not getting to know my kiddo. Mm -hmm. You're not getting to know my child. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really easy. And one of the things at Peace Partnership that we do is we do not bill out to insurance. We do not diagnose. 
And the reason for there's there's very specific reasons for that. The reason that we don't do that is because in order to get paid by insurance, you have to diagnose. Mm. Mm, makes sense. That that was the and this is this is I'm telling all the dirty secrets of counseling. <laughs> um, everybody, that's all, good. Anybody who's a mental health professional is like, shut up, stop talking. <laughs> um, the entire reason for the DSM is because of insurance. It's not for the patient. It's not for the client. Uh, Isn't that something? That it's it is there is in the very back. There's what's called ICD nine codes, and it's those codes that you submit to insurance so that you can then get paid. Mm-hmm. Wow, that could get kind of tricky on your end. Oh yeah, and that's I mean, why we really avoid tricky. It. Yes. Well, no, no, yeah. no, no. I'm just well. Yes, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I'm saying you are opening up the door to have conversation with all different walks of life, all different mm-hmm. conversation. I mean, just. You just don't know what's going to come through the door. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's somebody who is, say, low income. Mm -hmm. And you know, because of your experience, that this person has this problem, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. This person may be one of those who does need to be medicated. Mm -hmm. How do you help that person? You can't diagnose it. You can't give them a prescription because Mm -hmm. you can't diagnose it. Do you tell them that they need to go see a doctor that they can't afford now, like a medical doctor? Yeah. Well, and in those cases, uh, we will work with uh, just a couple of different uh, doctor's offices or, or psychiatrists in town who we're like, okay, these are people in, in our opinion that they have done right by the people that we have sent to them. And we will tell them like, okay, yeah, this is, this is going to be a bill for you, but you, I, I really think that this is going to be in your best interest. Mm-hmm. And so that we absolutely, we have a very collaborative uh, relationship with a number of other counseling offices because Peace Partnership is relatively small. And I am a quality type of a guy. I'm not a quantity type oh, of a guy. Good. Um, I, want, I, want to, I want to stay in our lane and I don't want to go outside of our lane if, if it's not something that we can do with excellence. Right. I, don't, I don't want to follow an example. I want to be an example. Yeah. And so we, we pride ourselves on the idea that uh, you could pick our office up and you could set it in you know, Johnson County. You could set it in Leewood, wherever, and we'd fit right in. Okay. And we offer that level of services to the people that otherwise would never, ever be able to afford it. And there was one lady that I work with. She's from the Urban Corps. Um, and horrific uh, circumstance. My specialization in my doctoral work is grief and trauma. And so I work a lot with people who have experienced some very, very dark, bad things, let's say. Okay. Uh, and she was uh, referred to us. Um, she was a school bus driver uh, at a local school district. And she was referred to us because she had moved out of the urban core. Her sister, her, she had an identical twin sister. And her sister... Um, was still living uh, in the urban core and had just recently become a Christian. And so she was bothering her sister, essentially kind of nagging at her to go to church with her. <laughs> okay. And so she finally said, okay, well, fine. Well, I guess her sister was dating, my client's sister was dating uh, some big time drug dealer and the drug dealer found out about this and was high as a kite and was driving in his car and got just flew off the handle and got mad and ran his car into a telephone pole and oh. killed both of them instantly. Oh my gosh. And they could not, the police or whoever could not get a hold of the mother. And so my client had to go identify the body. Oh no. Right. So here she is looking at her identical twin. Right. Uh, and it just, as you can imagine, Ugh. really, really took a toll on her. Mm. And so it's, it's working with her. She was one of our uh, $5 a session clients. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it was just working with her. I worked with her for several months. And one of the things that she said, and we got her all, you know, got everything, you know, kind of straightened out, got everything put back together, um, all those different moving pieces, and got her out of HUD housing, um, got her out of the situation. She was dating some loser at the time. Um, she ended up. Wow. So up your th- your counseling goes above just oh yeah talking to them. Like oh, you're yeah. trying to find them a new and better path oh, in life. Oh, oh what yeah. Did, what this did you is say? Our community. You're, you're, it's about finding a way. Yes. Right. Is that this, what you said earlier? Yes. Yeah. This yeah. is our community. It makes mm-hmm. sense for us to help these people. Mm-hmm. Like this is our backyard. <laughs> I firmly believe that. that so yeah. cool. Like we we want to. We want to help people. Um, 
And I'll talk about our school services here in just a minute. But um, one of the things that we did, yeah, we got her out of the urban core. She moved to Blue Springs, got her in an apartment. She's doing very well. And one of the things that she liked was uh, she said, well, I really like music and I really like driving. That's mm-hmm. why she was a bus driver. Mm-hmm. But she's like, bus driving just isn't paying the bills for mm-hmm. me. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, fine. Let's find something that will. So we're exploring all these different options. And finally, what she ended up doing is she ended up working for uh, an auto parts place delivering auto parts to, ah, yeah, yeah, right, to all these different places. She's driving, she's listening to her music, and in no time, she's managing other people doing that, mm. right? So, because she found her lane. Right. Yeah. Like this is, and it's so fascinating. Once you find your lane, you will watch yourself excel in that lane if you extend some effort to mm-hmm. it. And so she's doing very well. We're kind of tapering services off, and I have the very stereotypical leather couch in my office right this is the counselor's couch do you get to do the patients get to lay down on it and cross their arms that, on their chest and close their eyes yeah, that's right yeah i have some of them joke and they do that's what we need in here for yeah. the podcast. that's what i wanted i there want to go. lay on the couch while we that's right well we got a couch over i've got a couch I for mean, you i just need to change the camera get out of camera or something yeah right. anyway yeah. Go ahead. i'll just I'll, I'll sit behind you be very freud and i'll sit behind you and ask you questions <laughs> about your mother you know yeah you know well, well, we could probably set this up and just change the camera if you guys want to really reenact <laughs> Right, right, I can right. make that happen. Yeah. And how long have these problems been plaguing you? Yes. you know? Oh yeah. wow, you this is not the first time yeah. you've had, you played <laughs> oh, that no. part. Uh-huh. Lots of clients come in and joke about that, you know. I'm sure. Go um, but she, she so she's sitting on my couch and we're kind of about two thirds of the way through one of our final sessions and she just gets very quiet. And all of a sudden she 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 runs her hand on the the couch cushion beside her and she's not saying anything. She just runs her hand along this. Uh, And she looks up at me and she has tears in her eyes. And she says, thank you for treating me with dignity. Oh, wow. That's good. Right. Isn't that something? Yeah. Uh, And, and that is something that I have subscribed to for years and years and years. It's, it's the relationship that heals. You know, that's a really interesting point. I'm not going to say that I've never gone to counseling before. Again, that's something I don't like to admit on a podcast, but I have. And one of the the the, uh, the fears, I guess, going into it is that you sore, sorry, pathetic loser, mm. you couldn't figure it out on your own. Now you've got to mm. go to counseling mm. that this person's going to have to fix your life for you because you were strong enough or smart enough to figure it out on your own. Yeah. So you feel like you've lost a little bit of dignity before you even go sit in at the first session, before you even call and make the appointment, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes it's not necessarily this, um, this doctor esque type of, thing that you need. You just need somebody with a little bit of experience on how to navigate tough situations to sit down with you and just give you a little bit of guidance. A hundred percent. And and by having, taking that approach and making somebody feel like they have some dignity, it gives them inspiration and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspiration and excitement to continue the process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like when you go to a first counseling session, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody else but myself, but you're dreading it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. dread like, gosh, I don't want to go do this. Yeah. I'm going to have to find out how much I suck. i find out how screwed up I am or how in this particular area of my life I'm so screwed up. Mm-hmm. But I loved how you hit on that because that was the feeling that I had where I didn't, I, I lost some dignity mm-hmm. that I had to go do this. Mm-hmm. I had no other choice. I surrendered to the mm-hmm. to counseling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes. And what I will often tell people too is that uh, I am not your guru. Okay, I am, I am not the guy that is going to, you know, impart these words of wisdom to you that is just going to change your life. Yeah, yeah. I, yes, I, I do know some things because I've been doing this for such a long time at such a high level, and I will help you. But I am a guide, and you should not view me as anything more than that. Yeah, That's what you should view me as. And if, if, if I would have stepped at a diff, in a different place in life, you'd be in my seat, and I'd be over there. And I firmly believe that. I think that there's different types of intelligence. You know, if I picked up the average Joe here in Kansas City and took him back to, you know, rural Colorado on a ranch, boy, you'd feel pretty dumb. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. really quick. Right. Uh, and likewise, you know, I mean, if you drop me off in the financial district of New York City, yeah, I'd feel pretty out of place. Yeah. Feel pretty mm-hmm. dumb. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not about, you know, someone, me being smart or anything like that. It's about us finding a way. 
we can find a way forward. And you, you, you come alongside that person uh, in a very, very tangible way. And you say, hey, let's, let's work through this and let's you and I, let's, let's collectively agree that we are going to set aside any sense of shame and any sense of embarrassment. And the reason that we're going to do that is for the purposes of growth. Yeah. Because shame causes hiding. That's what it's caused since the fall. Shame causes hiding. And if you are hidden, we're not ever going to discover what is at the core of really bedeviling your life. So let's set that aside and let's just make observations about things and we can we can judge them later. And all a judge people get judgment and condemnation confused. Mm-hmm. All a judgment is is saying this is better than that. That's all a judgment is. Now, condemnation, conversely, says you're bad in your totality. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, yeah, let's take our foot off that gas pedal. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How about completely um, off? Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, people are in counseling because they haven't accurately judged their own life. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it's like, okay, well, let's, there's no shame about that. We, we do the same thing. It's not like, well, well. John, John sins less than me. And so let's go talk to him, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Like, no, it's just that I know this one area. Uh, That's, that's all. Yeah. That's all. Is this a ministry for you? And what I mean by that is, I mean, any, I think anyone who's a Christian, whatever they're in is their ministry, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can be a minister anywhere in any walk of life. But if, does everyone who comes and lays on your leather couch, (laughs) um, they may be seeking, um, counsel that involves Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? But Mm -hmm. they may not be. Mm -hmm. So does it anyway, because I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm just curious. Like, is it, is it, is it a given that this is part of our structure? This is part of what we talk about is your like, actual identity yeah or or no is it just kind of where it goes no i think i uh, i operate off of the premise that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience Mm. okay i do not operate off of the humanistic standpoint that we are physical beings and maybe or maybe not uh we will have this spiritual experience at some point in the future i don't i just don't believe that Okay. Um, and so I operate off of that premise and what I will say to people, and I have a lot of uh, people, I, I have this weird inroad into the hipster community. <laughs> I have no idea why, but hmm. the, I, 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 I'm not a traditional counselor in the sense of the, the, the cognitive behavioral route. I'm more of a psychoanalyst. Hmm. And so I practice counseling from that standpoint. I practice counseling from a very existential standpoint. Uh, existential just simply means that there are fundamental givens of our existence that because we exist, we will struggle with certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, freedom, love loss, meaning in life, you know, those types of things. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I, again, I, this is just an, an assumption that I have. I, I know that there are people that struggle with mental illness and with mental health issues, but I don't see them as such. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, people don't come to counseling because they struggle with mental illness issues. They come to counseling because they have life complexity issues. Mm. Yeah. And life has just spun out of their control and they need help. Jeez almighty, this sounds like they, my life. <laughs> they, they just need help putting the pieces back together. And doesn't that sound better anyway? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doesn't it sound for better? Sure. I mean, like, wouldn't you rather just, because you always say, oh, I hate admitting, you know, saying I do. mental it's illness, sick. It struggling just makes me with s- it. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you rather just say, I'm just struggling with life. For sure. Or yeah. life complexity, sure. if you want to use a big word. But otherwise, just like, life's just a lot right now. Yeah, yeah because that looks the term like mental you. health or mental illness just has such a negative connotation to it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I just got out, I just got off track here for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and here you also hit on something and I've talked about that on, about this, on this podcast several times as the biggest thing that I learned in what I was dealing with was internalizing is destructive. You don't necessarily mm. need to go to a counselor. Mm. You can talk to a family member. You can talk to a close friend, whoever it is that you have confidence in and you're comfortable speaking with. But I was feeling so much shame mm. and disappointment in myself that that I was afraid of what other people would think, mm-hmm. which was weird. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. because there was a certain, I'd reached a certain level of success because I didn't care what people thought. And then people started to recognize the success that I was having. And I remember on several occasions, and I don't want to over exaggerate it, but I, it was more times than I could count where people would reach out to me and say, hey, I've seen what you've been doing with this. I'd like to get your opinion. You know, so I noticed that people were recognizing mm-hmm. the progress that I was making in my life. Right. And right. so now if they notice the fallback. That there's been some, that some they, of it falling apart or something yes. failing that they're going to think, yes. oh, well, he's. He was a fake. He was a phony. Right. He's yeah, a failure. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So then I'm like internalizing all the shame. I didn't know how to, to express it. And so I held that in for two years mm. to where then it started to physically affect my body. Sure. Where I was having these weird itching attacks on a road trip. Like, yeah. my, and, and then I had the anxiety panic attack on an airplane before it took off from Vegas where I never had any of these issues before I go to my doctor and he says, you're, you've got the, 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 and the, 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 um, I'm stumbling all over the place here. I'd been internalizing all of that for so long that it was starting to physically take over my body. Mm -hmm. It was starting to physically affect my body. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. He did put me on an antidepressant for, um, for, well, he put me on the antidepressant. It was my choice to stay on it for however long I wanted to stay on it. But um, I didn't want to be dependent on Mm -hmm. medication, Mm -hmm. but it did help. Mm -hmm. It did help get me chemically balanced to the, because what I needed was to find some clarity. Mm -hmm. Okay. How did I get here? Where am I at? Feel free from the shame, begin talking about it. And then, you know, finding, Oh, how do I get out of this? Yes. Yeah. And Ronnie, you mentioned, you mentioned something um, really, really fascinating that I hear a lot in people's stories. uh, And that is the idea of where am I at? Mm. And what I tell people is that, uh, a lot of times people find themselves in very, very tough situations because they've lost their way. And the first thing that you should do if you lose your way is you should stop moving. <laughs> you, you, it's kind of like that pit. If it, you're in a pit, quit digging. Quit digging, yes. <laughs> so if you don't know like, where you're going, yeah. stop. Yeah, it's that old like adage, that. right? That, yeah. oh, well, I don't know where we're headed, but we're making great time. You know, <laughs> it's that idea. <laughs> you know, like, no, stop moving. Because if you don't know where you're at, that means you don't know where you're going. Right. And if you don't know where you're going, that means if you go straight, if you turn left, if you turn right, up, down, whatever, you could be making a catastrophically bad decision. Mm-hmm. So let's figure out where you're at and mm-hmm. then we can move forward. This sounds like something from an old book. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm guessing it's an old musty smelly book. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, like so it. it's, it's, it's that, like it. it's that type of a, it's that type of, of thinking that is helpful for people because it, it, it conceptualizes the issue in terms that they can understand that mm-hmm. it gives them some handles, right? Cause one of the, one of the problems with, uh, shame is that it it's not even really an emotion it's something that it's a sensation it's something that you feel in your being so to speak mm-hmm. and people they there's no handles to that they can't wrap their minds around it they're like what am i supposed to do with this yeah and so by saying it that way oh it, it breaks it down into manageable pieces okay let's first let's stop let's figure out where you're at in life let's figure out what's going on let's figure out let's figure out these contributing factors, and then we can move forward uh, as an example. So uh, on my Genesis counseling side of things, I uh, worked with a guy who's very, very successful. His wife had come in and uh, or his, his wife had come to him and had out of the blue said, uh, I want a divorce. Okay. And this completely just took him by surprise. Okay. okay. Uh, lives uh, over in uh, Johnson County, drives downtown every day to go to work. And, and I had gone through a couple of sessions and I just couldn't make sense of it, right? Uh, he was lost and subsequently I was lost as well. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, when I was trained that whenever that happens, again, you know, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, okay? okay? I need to stop moving and I need to figure out where I'm at with this client, with this person. I need okay. to figure this out. So what I asked him is I said, um, Give me a detailed breakdown of your week. Okay. So, well, uh, I work downtown, so I get up uh, pretty early in the morning. Uh, How early is early? Well, I'm a runner, and so I get up at four, and I try and put in about 40 miles a week. Uh, Okay. So I run for, you know, hour, 
hour and a half, um, take a shower, have breakfast, and then I go into work and I want to miss the traffic. Uh, so I go in about seven. Uh, okay. Uh, and then you're there all day. Yep. There all day. Now I usually stay a little late because I want to miss traffic. Uh, so I, you know, come home about six. Okay. Uh, anything else you got going on? Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm the, um, president of my HOA. Okay. Uh, how many houses are in your HOA? Uh, about 250. Okay. Uh, and anything else? Yep. Uh, I've got uh, two kids and I am my uh, daughter's uh, soccer coach. <laughs> uh, okay. And I said, um, well, I've got good news for you. Well, what's that? I know why your wife filed for divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Well, you don't have time for her. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he just literally, he sank down into my couch and said, I have never thought of that. Right? So it's just a different perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you don't know where you're at, it seems obvious to everyone, but you have to stop long enough to figure that out. Yeah, and his perception is, man, I'm busting my ass. I'm getting up early. Yeah. I'm doing the things I got to do to be mentally healthy. I'm working out. I'm going to work early. I'm working yeah. late. I'm trying to be a good dad. I'm involved with my kids. Why wouldn't any wife or woman want to honor that or recognize that or appreciate that? Yep. And a woman's built differently. Yes, and yeah, she wants men, men are built to handle their business. Men like to win. People oftentimes think like, well, with this issue of divorce, like, well, what keeps men in marriages? And most women, if you ask them that, they will jokingly say sex, right? Uh, and I say, I'm not trying to be crude, but no, uh, for 50 bucks, a guy can go find that, yeah. okay? It's not sex that keeps men in marriage. It's the ability to make their woman happy. Yeah. That's what keeps men in marriages. Ladies, if he can't win with you, <laughs> oh, be careful. Be careful, right? Now, yeah. conversely, on the other side of that, well, what keeps women in marriages? Feeling cherished. Mm -hmm. Men, d does she feel like you worship the ground she walks on? Because if she doesn't feel unique, if she doesn't feel special, oh, yeah. boy, be careful. Yeah. Because she's going to find somebody who will. Uh, and so it's just, it's things like that, that, that when people, they, they realize that that's when real change starts to happen. And change happens when you move something from the want column in your mind to the need column that people say, oftentimes they're well-meaning, but misguided, like, well, change takes a long time. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I see change happen <laughs> just instantaneously, absolutely instantaneously, mm -hmm. it, but you shift it in your mind. It, yeah. It's not like, well, I really want to change. No, I, I've got to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's usually they'll say something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I cannot do this anymore. This is over. Right? They'll say something like that. Yeah. No. The thing about that, what you just said, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it has to be fluid too. Mm. You know, like the person who wants to, um, you talked about the man's need being that the woman, um, what was the, what, how'd you say it? To make the, the ability to make their woman happy. Yes. Yeah. Right. So if he's not getting that, then she's not feeling cherished. And if she's not feeling cherished, then, you know, it's just, it's one without, you know, a vicious and, yeah. cycle it's a vicious of, cycle. Uh -huh. Exactly. And yeah. so it's hard for, and I'm saying this mostly to be proactive or um, inspirational, I guess, is just the, uh, it's hard for someone when they don't feel like that they're getting what they need yes. to continue doing what they need to do. Yes. You know, yeah. like I'm not getting what, you know, if a man's feeling like I'm not doing what I need to do to make her happy and I'm not getting sex. And so how do I cherish her? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm having a hard time going out and cherishing this person who isn't giving me what I need. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to that person who's, who's having that feeling to challenge them to continue cherishing them beyond what they're missing out on? Okay. So in situations like that, um, what I try and do is, uh, I will, I'll do something. I, I affectionately refer to it as a mind virus. A mind virus. <laughs> I will implant a little mind virus. And here's okay. how you do that. Would you say that you're more mature than your spouse? Well, yeah. <laughs> right. And then I say, well, then be more mature. You cannot give Burn. like, yeah. You can, <laughs> that doesn't you, sound I'm, like a virus. That sounds like yeah. a, yeah. I'm a, a I, I, I tell people all the time that like, I am not a make you feel good counselor. I'm a prepare you for anything type counselor. Uh -huh. Okay. And 
then you cannot give like for like and also in the same sentence say, I'm better than her. I'm better than him. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You're mm -hmm. doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So, and to, to guys, I say, well, you know, do, do you know, do you know why your wife is mm -hmm. testing you? Do you know why she's doing that? Well, no, why? Because she's a woman. Because that's what women do. Because women like to be pursued. Yeah. So pursue her mm -hmm. and pursue her until she finally says, okay, yeah, you got me. Yeah. Like that's what you did to catch her in the first place. Right. So I've been, I've been accused before, <clears throat> maybe just once or many times <laughs> of talking to my husband, like he's one of the kids. Mm. Mm. Right. And I don't, I don't mean to, I, I really don't mean to. And he doesn't, he doesn't do it like. He usually doesn't do it in the heat of the moment. You know, he doesn't so what does like that a, sound stop like? talking to me like a... Like, give me an example. Um, well, I, ha I have learned with, with one thing, not to group him with the kids, not mm. to be like, everybody needs to pick up their stuff, you know, like, oh. like and, and, and equalize. If I'm, it's fine if I say... Because then he feels belittled? I guess, yeah. I mean, which <clears> it makes sense. Like, I don't want him to talk to me. I'm not... Like he's your authority the, figure. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not equal with the kids either. Mm. So if I'm just telling everybody to pick their stuff up and maybe sock balls is a thing in our house. Like I don't want sock balls. I don't want to jam my hand into your dirty sock <laughs> to unball it, to wash it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not washing sock balls. Right. But if I put, if I say that to him in the same way that I might say it to the kids, I, I, it's just, it's not respectful. Now I can go to him and say, listen, <laughs> You're usually pretty good about not leaving sock balls, but lately I know you're tired and you just want to get the socks off your feet and it's the fastest way to, I, whatever, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> My socks are never in balls. I don't know why the sock balls. <laughs> it's just a thing. It's a thing. But I can't like do it in the heat of the moment. I yeah. can't go pick up the laundry and then yell at him because sock balls again, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm going to mm -hmm. have, I have done it. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's usually really good about not approach it, whatever it is in the heat of the moment, it might be later. So then he's taught me to do that with him too. And just mm -hmm. say, listen, I know you're tired and you just want to get your dirty socks off your feet and take a shower and just relax. Cause you've worked all day. Right. But then when I go to get the laundry and there's sock balls, when I've asked you to not have sock balls, <laughs> it feels, it feels directed at me, even though it's absolutely, I know it's yeah, not, sure. yeah. but I take it personally. Yeah. Because my job in the home is to do the laundry and the, you know, like, yeah. yep. but I don't want to, I don't want sock balls. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going yeah. to do the laundry, but I just don't want sock balls, you know? Yep. And so if, but if I just every time jam my hand in the sock and took care of it and never said anything, I'm, I'm defeating my own self by not dealing with it and not communicating is how mm -hmm. I've, how we've figured out ourselves mm -hmm. that like for me to shut down and just never say anything about it. That's not going to work because I'm not going to, it's not going to yeah. annoy me less. Yeah, correct. I was barring yeah. a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. barring God saying, you know what? Sock balls aren't going to bother you anymore because <laughs> right. they're going to bother me. Um, but in the same way, he's, he's going to have issues with how I'm, you know, he might say, Hey, listen, lately you've been, you're talking to me like I'm, like I'm one of the kids Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I don't appreciate that, you know, like, mm -hmm. so we've just learned that, that those kinds of communication can't happen when we're feeling the heat and heavy of it. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. That, yeah, that then we have to have a conversation and go, listen, this is, mm -hmm. this is not working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I tell people that uh, with regards to marriage communication, a good rule to remember is you need to strike when the iron is cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Don't deal with things. For the, sure. the, the time to deal with some complex marriage issue is not, in the heat of the marriage issue, mm -hmm. like find a good time. And usually you need, to, uh, and this is, this is a kind of an existential thing. You need to push away all the everyday issues of mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. so that you can adequately deal with these things. That's one of the reasons why counseling is so effective uh, at, you know, Carl Jung coined this term that self-actualization, you know, that you really grow and you mature is that it, it does that. It pushes all the everyday concerns, the soccer practices or softball practices, mm -hmm. and all of those things. It pushes those outside of the counseling office. And we're just talking about one thing. Yeah. And in our busy, busy world, 
we don't do that that mm-hmm. often. Uh, and so that's a, that's a big, big thing for married couples to remember is don't deal with it in the heat of the moment. Um, feelings are going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll, you're going to violate, uh, you're going to violate some major marriage communication issues. Sure. Uh, and when that happens, uh, you're going to build contempt. You're going to build criticism. You know, the other person's going to stonewall you. They're going to get defensive and right. it just builds from there. Right. Okay, so we're going to take a break here in just a bit, but I wanted to give you the opportunity because I set it up as an example of a guy who's coming to you who's married and he's having a hard time cherishing his wife because he isn't getting what he needs. And then you use the little mind game to basically say, who's the more mature person in the relationship? Then act like it. Mm -hmm. Let's go from from the role of a woman who's not getting what she needs and she's having a hard time making him feel valuable and giving, you know, uh, you know, intercourse or whatever it might be. What do you say to the wife? To the wife, I would say that, well, a, a lot of times there is some, um, there's some extenuating circumstances. Uh, and so I would have to, it's know. always different for the woman. I mean, I'm so sick of this crap. Why do you counselors do them? So wait, so you're saying uh, life complexities are a little more complex yes, for women. There's, yes. Um, and the reason that I, I, I believe, and I really, I, I'm not trying to mm-hmm. speak Stereotype. out of both sides. I know <laughs> Ronnie's like, I'm not having this man. Like, this is the last time I'm having this guy uh, They on. always Forget get a it. free pass in some way, shape, right. or form. And it's just so black and white for the guys. It's, they're, yeah. they're so extra. Uh, right, <laughs> Wait, right. we're so extra. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, so I'm joking, obviously. Go I, ahead. I believe that it is a more complex, nuanced situation for women because I believe that women contemplate their mortality at a younger age age. Mm. Um, women are from a very early age. They are playing with dolls. They're being a mother. Yeah. They're playing house. They're playing doctor, taking care of people. They're doing all, they're planning their wedding, right? I mean, how many women do other women know that they plan their wedding from the time they're a little girl, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's very, very yeah, common. Sure. So Guys don't do that. No. Right? Like, no. Yeah. Like when we're 10 or 12 or 15, like we're trying know, to figure out how to make the NFL. Ex- right. Yeah. I'm thinking about, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so yeah, I'm thinking about like catching frogs and crawdads. You yes. know, I'm not thinking about yes. the existential meaning of marriage, you know? Exactly. And so uh, they, they, and I think that they come across that naturally because I believe that women were created for the expressed purpose of relationship. If you think about it, if you go clear back to Genesis, is Genesis chapter two. Adam had just been created, and he had just named all of the animals in the garden. Mm -hmm. Now, that in and of itself is a fascinating study because, I mean, how smart would you have to be to go like, oh, that's an aardvark, that's a turkey, that's an Mm -hmm. elephant. I mean, yeah. And where did he get the word? I mean, God had to give him those words, right? Because You'd think, yeah. I don't Um, know. So right after that... (laughs) Uh, and I, again, I, this is not expressly stated in the text. I'm just reading some psychological significance into the text, okay? okay. Mm-hmm. But right after that, God says, it is not good for man to be alone. That is in the text. That is that in the text. That part is in the, yes. That, that part good. is there, yes. And it's right after that that Eve is made. And mm-hmm. I think where I'm taking liberty here is mm-hmm. I think that as Adam is naming all of these animals, psychologically, he's saying, you're not like me, you're not like me, you're not like me. Mm. And he may be the only person to have ever lived to really, truly understand what it means to be in complete isolation. He was Mm. alone. Wow. And I think that that's when God says, this is not good. (laughs) This is bad. This dude needs somebody. This dude needs somebody. And... Yeah. Women. Sure. Right. We, we get women for that. And so I think that it is a more nuanced uh, thing. And for sex, uh, or rather for women, sex is a, 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 a much more intimate uh, thing. Uh, and so uh, men tend to uh, trivialize sex uh, to a certain degree. It, it's much more about the physical act of it. And for women, that's just not the case. That's not been my experience from the women that I've talked to. Mm-hmm. And so there, there is, they have to feel connected in order emotionally in order for that to be uh, a part of the relationship and so in that type of a situation we might build to that like if there's an affair that has happened and both you know mm-hmm. parties have agreed that we're going to work on the marriage and get mm-hmm. things you know put back together uh, we can build to that but for the guy i would say like hey 
um, that part of your relationship has been wrecked. And we need to put these pieces back together again so that she feels connected with you. And when she feels connected with you, the sex will come. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you not put the cart before the horse because otherwise what the woman can feel like is the woman just feels cheap and used. And then that violates my, you know, kind of my, my tenant rule of like, does she feel unique and cherished? Mm -hmm. Well, No. Mm -hmm. So. Mm, I, 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 see you, I see you thinking well, over there. So my gosh, I'm just so many things. Yeah, I'm just, I, you know, you talked about, I, I don't want to cause a, a cause controversy or be argumentative, but you use the term that guys, and you're the doctor, right? I'm certainly not. But you said that, that men typically uh, find sex to be trivial. They can. They can, right. Yeah. And I, I can see that. And, and I can see where I've even treated it like that at points in time in my life. But I think that there's also this thing that guys have based on conversations that I have with other guys who are married is it's not necessarily just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And then Mm -hmm. feeling gratified or good because guys don't like that. Mm -hmm. Guys don't want to just get off and be done. They want to feel like they're wanted from their wife. And And when their wife feels like they have to do it just because, Oh my God, he's not going to leave me alone if I don't do it. And yeah. that sucks too. Yes. So yes. I, I, I want to kind of defend the guy a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, or most guys or those who, you know, because I don't want it to feel like most men or in this conversation, men are taking it like, you know, maybe I'm not that guy who treats it as trivial. Yes. I physically expressive and physically enjoy that, that act, but this is what I really get from it is when my wife is into it and she wants me and she's looking at me with the desire that I'm the man, Mm -hmm. you know, that's when the sex is enjoyable for the guy. Mm -hmm. And when they don't have that, then it's just. (sighs) Yes. And and yes. And I, Ronnie, I would agree with you. And I would add to that, that um, it's, it's the immature individual that just wants to kind of go through the motions, so to speak. Um, That, that that's the individual that is trivializing sex. And it's almost in the sense of like, well um, you know, even though we do have this big problem in our marriage, uh, you owe me sex, mm. and and that's just part of the deal. Okay, you know it's that type of it where it's it's like, buddy, you're yeah. not you're not getting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just yeah. not understanding what's going on here. We've got bigger fish to fry, mm-hmm. and we need to get after that. Sure, yeah. sure, fair enough. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna take a break. We guys, woo, covered a lot there, and look, we are almost into this thing. Uh, two hours. So we're going to get close to wrapping it up because I don't want to keep Dr. John Thompson here longer than he can be. Definitely want to get into how we can help peace partnership with the Heartland uh, Premier Charity Golf Classic as well. And I wanted to get a little bit more clarity about your childhood and, and the relationship that you have with your parents. We'll try to do that next when we return in episode 34 of the Papa Ron Podcast. The Papa Ron Podcast is brought to you by the award-winning Heartland Waterfowl, airing each week on Sportsman's Channel. Check out heartlandwaterfowl.com for airtimes and be sure to browse their online store. Also, subscribe to the Heartland Waterfowl YouTube channel and watch their new original series, including their podcast, Behind the Blind. Check it out and don't doubt the scout. Now, back to the Papa Ron Podcast. Here's Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. All right, the Papa Ron Podcast also brought to you by Clean AF. Clean, polish, protect, specifically formulated to protect and beautify surfaces, including plastic, vinyl, rubber, and carbon fiber. Water-resistant formulation is safe to use on gloss or matte finishes and makes the cleanup process easier by forming a durable coating that repels mud, dirt, and debris. Apply lightly, buff to a dry sheen. Perfect for all power sports enthusiasts. Purchase online at cleanabsolutelyflawless.com or check them out at Dell's Power Sports in Grain Valley, Missouri. All right, so um, I wanted to go back real quick to your childhood because I'm just fascinated with that because at some point in time, uh, you got kicked out of the house. And so we never really got to that point on what you did, how bad it was that your parents... And then at some point, you go, you come to Kansas City and, and you go through this process of, I guess, finding yourself mm-hmm. and becoming a Christian or being saved from by Christ. And then going back and having, and then of course, taking in all the information that you get by going through the schooling of being a psychologist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at some point you had to have closure mm. with your family, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Like maybe yes. she needed to forgive you and you needed to forgive her. Um, 
but before we get to the forgiveness, what was it that was that was the uh, tipping point to where you were booted from the house and you needed to find a place to live? So my behaviors uh, during my high school years just gradually continued to escalate, uh, and they they became borderline kind of criminal in nature. Uh, so criminal, yeah. So I was we were doing things. Um, uh, vandalism, uh, egging houses. Um, I was in lots of fights, uh, that, that time. Were you a violent person? Was violence part of the problem that you had? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I, I think, uh, to, to a large extent it was, uh, violence for me was just part of that, uh, misplaced aggressive nature. Um, that I had all of this energy and I've always felt like that, that I just, I just have all of this energy and I just didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, it's like I didn't said, didn't play earlier, football, didn't do wrestling or anything in sports was, that would help you with that. Oh yeah. Um, but I, it was just different people have different capacities and I've just been, a, I've always just been a high capacity type of individual. I ran track. Uh, I played soccer. I did jujitsu. Wow. Um, did a lot of that. Uh, and I, it was just one of those things that I was, again, like I was just gonna, I was gonna live the life that I wanted to live. Yeah. Uh, and it, it gradually just escalated to a point where uh, I was drinking all the time. I was partying all the time. Uh, I was just not living uh, a good life. And of course I was at odds with mom and dad because mom and dad are saying like, look, you know, this is our house. And you know, you don't pay the bills here. We pay the bills. So something's going to have to give. Uh, and so it was one of those situations where it's like, okay, well, um, <clears throat> I'm out. <laughs> yeah. So that um, was your, that was that your, was your call, choice or it was like, that's where it was going. Like, was that's, there an ultimatum or was there a, that's where it was going. Yeah. Um, so you just, you made the call because you're yeah, in charge. It was, yeah. It was, yeah. It was like, okay, <laughs> like, all right, that's, you know, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. And again, I got to ask it before I forget it. So did you resent your parents through that entire childhood teen? Like, did you, did, was there any, hmm, how do I ask this? Did you have any affection for them? Like you might've been angry with them. They're trying to provide structure. You couldn't, you didn't want the structure. Did you hate your parents or did you ever like, sometimes I love them, sometimes I don't. And, and I guess ultimately where I'm going with this is uh, the second part of this question is what could they have done differently? with you like what yeah. what word they were doing the best with what they knew mm -hmm. if there is a person who's listening to this who has a high intensity child who doesn't handle structure and and is just kind of to do it themselves very independent what what can they do differently so that they don't have to go through what you and your parents went through okay well what you can do is if you feel if you have a kiddo like that <clears throat> excuse me if you feel that that is your kiddo Find people who who have got your kid's number. Uh, I was very, very blessed and lucky that all along the way, I had a number of people. Um, uh, Mr. Watson was a history teacher that I had who just, he just had me figured out. Mm. Um, uh, coach McDonald, my weightlifting coach, I was in a bodybuilding too when I was in mm -hmm. high school. Uh, he had me figured out. He just knew, and I don't know, he, he figured the John riddle out. Uh, hmm. He he just figured me out, and so you had a way of respecting them mm -hmm. and honoring them better than you did your parents, and so you were more receptive to listening to their discipline or their structure than your parents. Correct. Okay. Correct. What did they do different? It, honestly, um, I would love to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really don't know, and I have given that some serious serious thought. But they just had me figured out to a young age, and what I think again, um, I believe. Uh, life is, like I said, life is about finding a way. And I believe that God gave us six uh, basic human needs. Uh, Tony Robbins talks about this. He's okay. a kind of a motivational sure. speaker and stuff. Uh, brilliant, exactly. brilliant guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of his continuing education and training. I think he's a once in a generation genius. And he does a lot of work with these six basic needs. And so I do that as well. Okay. And the, the six basic needs are uh, criticism. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Now, now, now of course I now you're that. on the spot. Right. Yeah. Now that I'm on the spot. Uh, yeah, I know. Now, you want me I to know. Google it? You um, know them? I yeah. Know Google them. them. Let's, no. let's see. I, I can't, uh, usually I, I can remember them right off the top of my head. Um, well, I'll Google it. And then you, so there's, yeah, there's love, love and acceptance, significance, 
growth, contribution, um, certainty, and uncertainty. That's it. Okay. okay. So you got it. Yes. Okay. So those are the six basic needs. And I think that uh, we all have the six, those six needs, but we don't all value them equally. Okay. And for me, growing up in high school, I, I wanted to be immensely significant. And that men will die for significance. Uh, women will die for love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to be someone of significance. And I think that um, uh, Mr. Watson and uh, Coach McDonald, Coach Mack, I think that they, they were able to tune into that and realize that that was just kind of a part of my makeup and focus on that. Uh, I set the squat rep test um, in high school, uh, like all kinds, and I just... It was as many squats as you could do with the bar uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in 90 minutes. And I did just over about 7,000. Gee. And so you just, what? you just go and go and go and go and go. Oh my gosh. And, well, and, that seems like something that a, just that in particular, that particular need significance would be something that if a, that a coach of mm-hmm. any kind would probably be really in tune to. Yes. Just because if, if they're the go getter and they always want to, win and they always want to beat their own record and they always want to, you know, their personal best mm-hmm. is always mm-hmm. climbing and climbing. I would think mm-hmm. that would be Well, something. and at that level yep. too, coaches are teachers, right? And so yeah. they, yep. you know, yep. it's not like just a professional or somebody who solely gets paid on being a coach. Uh, they are teachers. And so I think what I'm hearing, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is, is that they were able to identify that you excelled and, and you would, they would earn your respect if they were able to praise you with the things that you good instead of always hearing how you're screwing up or doing things wrong, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so maybe, and again, I'm putting mm-hmm. words in your mouth, but maybe did your parents ever show pride in you or, you, or were you just that, that, that kid that was just getting into so much trouble that you felt like all you were was just in trouble all the time? And that's why yeah. you looked and sought out your coach and your and those people that your teachers because you did get the gratification and the feeling of self worth from time to time. Yeah, and I think that that was that was a large part of it. Um, I think that you know, uh, Coach McDonald would give me tasks that were just, um, you know, okay, John, you know, we got the squat rep test or we got mm-hmm. the curl rep test or whatever, and like we're gonna see what you can do. Yeah, and I always. <laughs> answered that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And early on, um, before I became a Christian, I was actually um, slated to go the special forces route. Uh, And that's Mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. I was in uh, one of the things I did, I was in shooting sports um, early on. And I was the uh, top shot in Mesa County for uh, six years in a row. Uh, I competed at the state level and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I just have always loved that. I love the precision about it. Uh, And so you weren't a complete I mean, screw up. No, no. I mean, you, it, yeah. when you first started this conversation, it just made it sound like that you were out of control and in yeah. a complete screw up. But like you were a lot of things that you did excel at. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I kind of kept that. Uh, I was very compartmentalized. Okay. Uh, and I, I kept that part of my life that was just chaos and madness and parties and fights and all that other stuff. I kept that very, very compartmentalized because I didn't want it to bleed over into some of the, and every once in a while it did. Like my senior year, uh, I got kicked off the track team mm. and I was, you know, set and I, in my junior year, I'd already set a couple of, uh, set a state record, wow. um, set, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, and I, yep. Got kicked, got kicked off because it. Mm. it just got, it just got to be too much. Okay. Uh, you, you can't balance those worlds. And that's what, that's a lot of what I, what I work with people on is there seems to be, as you progress in life, there seems to be a gradual divide that takes place. And when you're young, you have the energy to live in two worlds. You can hop back and forth between two worlds, but as you progress in life as you get older, but Mm -hmm. also as those two worlds build in intensity, so Mm -hmm. to speak, it becomes increasingly difficult to live in both worlds. And you're, you just can't do that. And I think that that's the case because it follows a biblical maxim. A man cannot serve two masters. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that was the case for me where I tried to keep these two worlds kind of compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 
in, in a <laughs> in a terrible way. I did a, a relatively good job ab- about it, but it 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 bled over uh, mm-hmm. into other areas of my life. And eventually, you just get to the point where okay, well, one of these is going to win, and one of these is going to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a this is a win lose situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just how it is. Mm-hmm. So part of that question that I I had for you was: Did you ever have affection for your parents? I mean, did it hurt yeah. when you left? I mean, or were you just pissed off? And when you were gone, did you regret? Like, I'm trying to get, to, I'm trying to understand your emotion. Mm. You spoke so affectionately of your dad. You know, when we were talking about going on that elk trip. Yeah. And granted, this yeah. is many years later, right? You know, yeah. and so there's been a lot. But I, I'm wanting to understand the relationship beyond the surface with your parents. You know, if you had any affection, if there was any tormenting that was going on, like you were hurting and you were depressed and you were like, why don't they just accept me for who I am? Or why don't they love me like other parents love kids? Like what, what was the anguish that you were feeling inside? And at what point, and again, I'm doing a new two parter question for you, but at some point there had to have been reconciliation and forgiveness on both sides. Mm -hmm. So speak Mm -hmm. to the emotion, the anguish, maybe there had to have been some anguish. You don't, you're not conducting yourself the way you're doing if you're not rebelling. I mean, because that's all this was, was rebelling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. At the time that I got kicked out, I was just angry. I was just furiously angry. And in kind of this, again, in kind of this like strange juxtaposition, I suppose you might say, I, I, I think that I knew deep down that mom and dad were living a better life. Uh, and I was just angry at kind of the structure of reality, so to speak, Okay, that, that I couldn't, like, why can't I live this way and have a good life? Gotcha. Right. It makes it, sense. It's that idea. Okay. And what I tell people, I don't want to get too far off track here, but I try and, and link that to something that a prominent psychologist, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about. Jordan Peterson, um, mm-hmm. that guy. Oh, he's the man. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, and he's the guy, from, we're talking about the guy from Canada, right? Yep. And he, he was on Joe Rogan mm-hmm. recently. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry. I just love that guy. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, go no, ahead. yeah. Uh, I listened to a lot of his stuff. I've listened to uh, hours and hours of his um, podcasts and interviews. I've taken continuing education from him. I mean, he's, I, I think that he is probably the foremost Western thinker alive today. Okay. Uh, genius, genius man. I agree. Uh, and uh, he talks about the psychological significance of the story of Cain and Abel. Okay. And one of the things that he talks about is he says that the, the story of Cain and Abel is not necessarily about one brother killing another. The story of Cain and Abel is about sacrifice. And if you don't or if you don't see or you don't notice that your life is going well, it's highly likely that you are not sacrificing the things that you ought to sacrifice in life. And and if that's the case, you really need to figure out what you need to sacrifice. And so as that applies to you, and as that applies to me, that was my problem. I wanted the fundamental structure of reality to bend its knee to my will. Gotcha. And it just wasn't. Yeah. And it made me mad. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, well, what happens? Well, when people are mad, uh, anger is an emotion primarily rooted in those six basic needs. It's rooted in certainty. Mm-hmm. Because when people are angry, they say certain, very, very certain concrete statements. This is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. They, they say things like that. You can hear it in their voice. And, when people are angry, it gets them moving, which can be detrimental, like it was in my case. Yeah. It can also be helpful, like it is in the case of someone who's depressed. Being angry is measurably better for a depressed person than being depressed. Because, like I said, anger gets you moving, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what they need to do. Well, I did not need to do that. Okay. <laughs> my problem was not depression. Mm-hmm. Right. I was the opposite of depression. Right. So my problem was that I needed to figure out, okay, what's going on with you? And it wasn't necessarily that I was angry at mom and dad specifically. I, I, they were the point men yep. for what I was angry at. Yep. I was angry that I couldn't live my life the way I wanted to live. Yep. And you're just in the way. Right. You represent that. And that's what was a constant frustration is my mom and dad constantly saying to me, John, this isn't a good decision. Mm-hmm. Did well, you love your parents through all of that? Uh, at the time, sadly, no, uh, I did not. I, I just 
hated them. I just was like, I, I don't care. I mean, I remember saying just stupid, reckless things to friends about, you know, if they died, I'm not going to their funeral and, wow. you know, like all just very, yeah. very stupid, careless things. Yeah. Um, and uh, thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> Are you the only child? No, I have a younger sister. Okay. Um, yeah. And she, How, lived, what's the age difference? Three years. Okay. So she was able to witness, I mean, if she's yeah. only three years younger and you're 18 years old, when you're getting kicked out, yep. she's old enough to understand what's going on here. Oh yeah. Did you have a decent relationship with her uh, at, at that time yeah. in your life? At, at that time uh, we did, it's kind of, you know, cause there, there were some things that were going on in the house that shouldn't have been going on in terms of just um, physical abuse things and stuff like that. And so uh, nothing unites people like a common trauma, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? Okay. And they call they call that a trauma bond. And so my sister and I at the time uh, were very close. Uh, and now we're, we're not close at all. Uh, my sister is the absolute uh, opposite of me. She is a, a very, very liberal, very godless uh, oh, person. Wow. Um, yeah, lives in Portland, Oregon. I mean, you know, uh, she's <laughs> working for... Uh, well, used to. I don't think she does anymore because Elon Musk took it over. You worked for Twitter. Twitter. I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, she was the poster child for not even liberal, but but that woke, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. sure type of person. Uh, and so, and it, it just again, it's that it's that gradual chasm that I talked about that um, there just came a point in time in our past where we just grew so far apart that um, we were we were just essentially living in two separate worlds, and there was no overlap anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's no, there's, there's no, no bond. Yeah. There's no bond. There's no point of connection there. So is she close so, with your parents? No, no, not at all. No. Uh, now they'll, they'll, I say they, because my sister has a daughter, um, they'll go visit, mm-hmm. uh, every once in a while, you know, things like that. Um, uh, but yeah, it was very, very, uh, strained relationship. Um, do you, I don't even know if I can ask it because it's a personal question about your family. Yeah, go ahead. Do you think it's because you dealt with things the right way in a healthy way and she didn't? Like, is she, is she, it doesn't sound like you hold resentment towards your parents. No, not at all. And it doesn't even sound like you regret leaving. Mm. Like, you know, you getting angry made you move and the move was moving out and then you found the Lord and, Calvary Bible college and that, you know, set you on the path. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't sound like you have resentment and regret and well, if they hadn't done this and they did this and back when I was 16, this happened and that you're, you're kind of doing that, that whole blame, Mm. blame game, pity party. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm this old now. And it's all because my parents did this or said this or treated me this way or whatever. So it, does she aspire more to that side or or what do you attribute that to? What do you think? Um, there was a, a series of events that happened in my sister's life that uh, really put her on a very, very dark path. Mm. Uh, and this is, again, she if she was here, she would probably argue this and say, you don't know what you're talking about because my sister's argumentative. <laughs> okay. Um, so, oh, I can uh, relate oh, to that. It's like, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Okay. Which sister are we talking about, yeah. Jillian? Aaron. Okay. <laughs> Aaron, you're, <laughs> but, you've been called. You, yeah. Anyway, but in, in my opinion, um, <laughs> she had, my sister is very, very intelligent. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the smartest women I know. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, she went to work at Intel uh, when she was in her mid twenties, uh, worked her way up and was, oh, I, I don't, this is a long time ago. Don't quote me on this, but it was something like the director of future technologies at Intel or something like that. I mean, she knew about um, waterproof, you know, foldable keyboards and stuff before, I mean, way before. Wow. Right. Okay. Um, so that's what she did. Then she um, uh, worked for Nike, um, did that for a while, shot through the ranks, and she was over like all of sales of South America. Hmm. I mean, wow. that, that's just her. You know, and, yeah. or, and then she was at all of sales for Europe. I mean, just crazy. So stuff. very successful is ultimately where you're going with this. Very successful, very bright individual. But I think, and that's a problem. Okay. So, because smart people are used to figuring things out. Mm-hmm. And when they can't figure things out, it's like a splinter in their mind and they just cannot stop fiddling with it. Mm. And I think that that was ultimately one of the problems that 
Karen ran across okay. uh, is that she she could not figure out her miscarriage. Uh, she had a miscarriage oh, okay. early on. I was wondering where you're going with that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Lost lost a, a baby uh, at, at the time, and it was kind of this perfect storm of events because she was, things were not going well with the her ex husband, the guy that she was married to at the time. Yeah. Uh, and she went to the church for help, oh, and boy. the church ate her alive. And that just absolutely torpedoed her. What do you mean by ate her alive? Uh, she wanted help, and they basically sided with her husband at the time. Okay. And there was no, let's talk about this. There's two sides of the story. There's There, there was none of that. So she, ba- I want to be careful about that because, I mean, some could potentially who already have issues with trying to understand if they want to be a believer. Mm is that, well, the church shouldn't be taking sides for anybody, right? Like, so it sounds, it, it, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I want to be careful. I, I guess what I'm ultimately saying is it sounds more like she went in there expecting the church to take her side and they weren't as uh, receptive to taking her side as she may have wanted. Well, the, yeah, churches, one of, the, one of the things, so we'll back up here just a little bit. So one, one of the things in churches that is in the research literature that pastors have talked about is okay. when they're polled is that they feel a little bit like there has been a little bit of a bait and switch in their seminary educations mm. uh, because they are um, really schooled and educated on sermon prep and exegesis and you know hermeneutics, Bible interpretation, all these things. But then when they get out into the field, into their actual profession, they do a lot of counseling. And they'll yeah. take maybe like one or two classes on counseling. Okay. And so there are people, there's a lot of pastors out there that say, hey, you kind of need to address that uh, at the seminary level. Yeah. And it, it's not being addressed. And what is required of pastors is different than what they're being schooled for. And so there are pastors out there who they just, they mean well, but they will say careless things. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Okay. That, that, that's about, that brings a lot of clarity to what so, I'm yeah. trying to understand. And, and people will say that, you know, a lot of people will say like, well, I don't want to go to church because there's hypocrites there. Well, then don't go to the grocery store. <laughs> right. right. Okay. And we talk about that yeah. all the time. We're like, all hypocrites yes. and we're all going to be hypocritic yeah. again at some point in time. So yeah. I guess to, to put a 30 or a little um, overview to what really happened then was your sister went in with, um, the wrong expectations and maybe the church didn't handle it as well as they could have. Yeah. So yeah. it was probably and anyway, so she had a bad experience mm-hmm. and then she said, and it's, she's scarred from it and yeah. has never gave it, given it another chance. That's what I'm hearing. No. Now, and now she, she, and she gradually, it's this gradual decline or decay uh, that, that took place over several years. Um, it didn't just happen all at once, but she gradually started going down, visiting more uh, atheist, um, forums, mm. uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, um, you know, you can argue till you're blue in the face with people online. And of course the other person's always right. Uh, and so <laughs> that was part, again, this is another thing. I can't make sense of this because I can't make sense of this. Therefore there must be some merit to it. Yeah. You know, those types of things. And it just gradually kind of spun out of control. Mm. Um, well, <clears throat> I guess I'll just say this. I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. And because um, that sucks. And I think that as Christians, we got to hear stories like that and realize that that's not just some crazy liberal woke person. That's somebody who needs Jesus. That's somebody who needs prayer. Yeah. That's somebody who needs us more than ever. Mm. And whether they want the help or not, you know, there's nothing stronger than prayer. And so, mm. um, We'll be praying for your sister on that because Thank you. that that's, Thank you. I think that's the mindset we as Christians need to take as opposed to just the girl went crazy. You bet. Um, you bet. So how were you able to, we're going to get into, okay, last question about your family. And then I want to get into peace partnership and how we can help. Um, how were you able to eventually reconcile with your parents? You talk, I didn't, I did you, you mentioned the abuse thing. Was that the abuse from them? The physical yeah. abuse? Okay. Yeah. So at some point there, there has to be some forgiving you know, what did that look like? So that just really was kind of a gradual process of growing a relationship uh, with them. And they're out in, again, they're out in Colorado. Uh, and I 
you know, Naomi and I enjoy going out to Colorado. Sure. Um, outdoor guy. Yeah. And so every single time we go to Colorado, it was gradually kind of touching base with mom and dad, um, doing day trips with them. Um, hey, let's grab lunch. Let's yeah. do these things. Um, texting back and forth now, you know, th- those types of things. And just, just gr- in being very intentional about growing that relationship. And like I said earlier, it's one of the things it's like, well, if, if you, if you say that you're more mature than Act someone, like it. you know, then you have to be more mature uh, and you have to, you have to reach out like, well, why, why doesn't mom or dad text me? Who cares? Yeah. Text them. Yeah. You know, um, do you want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and, and say to yourself, okay, um, I made my life 1% better today. Do you mm-hmm. want to be able to do that? Yeah. Then text them. Yeah. <laughs> or you know? or uh, on a, an extra note of that, if they don't like texting particularly and you know it. Right. Call them. Call them. Call them. What's <laughs> Write the a letter and put it in the mail because they sure. probably love that if they're 70-something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they probably like getting mail. Maybe. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Uh, At what point was it through your maturity or through your the growth in, <laughs> in your walk with the Lord that you then realized that you intentionally wanted to have a relationship with your parents regardless of any, you know, past things that were ugly that took place? I mean... That mean, that had to been confusing. It, it, it was, and one of the things that, uh, and this is where you know I got to give a lot of credit to Jordan Peterson. Um, he really, really helped me out with a lot of that, and I know a lot of men echo that sentiment. Um, but y- you, how do you know where you're going if you don't have an example? How yeah. do you know what you should do and what you should be? If you don't have an ideal, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, did, did mom and dad do everything perfect? No, of course not. You know, but, but did they do the best they could with the information that they had at the time? Yeah, I firmly believe that they did. And so why am I harboring that? And if, if, if the, if this is my mom and dad, I mean, I'm, you know, their genetic material, <laughs> essentially. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I need that example in my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to know what they know. Uh, I, that's a, that's a counseling maxim of mine. I always start off that way. I start off with the idea that the other person that I'm visiting with has something that they know that I don't know that I need to know. Right. And, and it's, it's a collegial type of a, an atmosphere that we're going to affect change in, not this top down. Yeah. Type of a thing. So well, that's what I wanted with mom and dad. What was it you said that the <clears throat> the counselor at Calvary said to you when you were complaining about your mom and he stopped you and said, I've got a question. What was the, yeah. what was the question um, about your past? Yes. He said, uh, when are you ever going to give up on the possibility of a better past? Yeah. Right. And that's exactly that. You, yeah. You can't, yep. you could, you could, whether you harp on your parents or not, or mull it around in your mind, mm-hmm. you're not going to change it. No. No, there's no changing it. Yeah, no, no, not at all. And and you just it it what it will feel like for for the listeners out there, what it will feel like is it will feel like, man alive, like I, I'm just you're just telling me to give up, John. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let go or Let be go. dragged. Yeah. Okay. Like those are your options. Yeah. People think that because, because problems are immensely complex, people tend to think that the solutions to those problems are equally complex. That's not true. That's not true. If I, if I come to see someone for counseling and let's say I'm, I don't know, beating my wife or something, you know, I'm a, a, an abusive husband. Well, we can get into all of the complexities as to why I'm that way and how that developed and all of those different nuances. We can get into that. But at the end of the day, don't you think I just need to stop beating my wife? <laughs> right. I mean, really? Right. That's mm-hmm. where it's at. That's mm-hmm. the solution. That, yeah. So or at least the first step. Yes. So that's, it, it, it follows that same idea that mm-hmm. like, okay, well, you're going to have to give up on that, John. And, and it feels like that. Okay, fine, give up on it. But you're not just giving up. You're also getting something in return. Yeah. And that's the 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 love and the affection of the relationship. Wow. You know, and so when when people understand that, like, oh well, I'm just I'm getting the short end of the stick. Are you? 
I don't know. Or are you just hanging on to that little stub of a stick? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Probably, probably are. <laughs> so how long did it take then when you, you know, because you said as a teenager and, and after you got kicked out, you were mad, you were angry and you did not love your parents. At some point you're going through this process of, you know, learning the word and um, being saved. Do you remember how long it took from when you were kicked out to feeling that affection of love for either of your parents? That was probably uh, into my mid to late 20s. Um, okay, so five, six, or six, seven years? Yeah, I'd probably say seven or eight. Okay. Um, pro- yeah, probably seven or eight years. Uh, and that was the idea that when you, when you think of someone and, and you think of something bad that they did, the question comes to mind, do I forgive them for this? And if I do, how often do I need to forgive them for this? And my answer to that is, if you're going to forgive them, which as Christians, obviously, we would say that we should. Mm-hmm. Right. If, we're, if you're going to, to forgive them, well, how often do I need to forgive them? Every single time you think about it. That's how often. Mm-hmm. And you that needs to be a process, and it needs to be ingrained in your mind. Because mm-hmm. prior to... This, my specialization uh, of grief and trauma, I specialized in neuropsychology. And it became increasingly clear that I was going to be working in some lab somewhere in a university, and I didn't mm-hmm. want that. I like working with people, so yeah, I, I yeah. dropped it. Um, but I, I really think that that's a fascinating field. And what you're doing when you think that way about forgiveness, like, okay, I need to forgive this person. Uh, I, need to give this, I need to give this back to God. What you're doing is you are forming different neural pathways in your brain. You're literally connecting different synapses. That's what you're doing. The reason that, you know, mad people get mad and sad people get sad and, you know, those types of things is because it's a pattern of behavior. And emotions don't happen to us so much as we go to them. Okay. That's what happens. Um, And... You, you have to form, if you want something different, you have to do something different. And oftentimes doing comes from thinking. You've got to, you've got to think different. In counseling, we call that metacognition, right? You're thinking about your thinking okay. is what you're doing. You're, you're intentionally catching yourself and saying, oh, okay, no, I can't think that way. And there was a time in my life when I could not remember one thing positive that my mom offered. Mm. Not one. Whoa. Now... Now, who's the crazy boy, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Was that true? No. Th- no, of course not. That's just where you let your of mind go. Of course not. Because yeah. here's the thing. Yeah. My mom was always helping people. <laughs> okay. Oh, it was it was crazy the time. I can remember time after time after time. Um, we're, there's a, you know, there it was a couple that we knew that um, he had committed suicide. And there was four kids and they live in this single wide trailer in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. And, you know, we went for an entire weekend and cleaned the whole trailer and took loads of laundry home and all this stuff. There, there's a, we were firewood cutters, right? Okay. That's how we heated our house in the winter. And we're up, you know, cutting firewood okay. up in the mountains. And there was somebody that was broke down and we spent the next four hours helping them. Okay. Like that's just over and over and over. Well, is it any wonder why I help people? Mm. right wow right. that's dear old mom yeah. right. that's what i'm saying like you 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 can't you can't separate those things mm-hmm. you can't do that and be honest mm-hmm. that's just not the case because at that time to go back to something you said way early on you were you were experiencing that because you were part of helping but mm-hmm. you were also observing it mm-hmm. right there were three things i can't remember what the other one was but mm-hmm. definitely you were observing that happening and then you bet you were it was like, you're going to help too. You, yeah. you weren't just going to watch. Yeah, so, you bet. And that's yeah. that's a very important thing um, in parenting is maybe maybe the most important thing is very understudied, consistency. Be consistent. Yeah. Be consistent. Let, it, it follows a biblical principle. You, you let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay. And that for, yeah, for mom and dad, they were always doing stuff like that. We were helping... You know, Quincy Hines was our neighbor. He's he is a genuine old school Colorado cowboy. Great okay. guy, um, and he's still he's still alive. I go back and see him when we're back there. He's a great guy. Um, it, it, yeah, we we were always 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 helping him. Hey, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, it just it it was that idea that mm-hmm. mom and unknowingly at the time that that was mom ingrained into me. Wow. So, did uh, last question? I promise. Did did it. 
did you eventually, I mean, you had to have closure at some point and it was the closure just like, look, I internally, I forgive, I recognize where I was wrong and she is proud of you and your progress. And so you don't really have a heart to heart come to Jesus moment where you both have closure. Did you have that conversation? Did you ever have the, the like, look, I'm sorry. And she says like, I'm sorry too. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that, that was, yeah, that was, that was a very, very pivotal uh, moment in our relationship. Who initiated that? Uh, she did. Wow. Uh, and that was a, that was a really, really, uh, again, that was a really, really uh, positive thing because you, you, you always look to your mom and dad to be an example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And here they are yeah. doing that. Yeah. You know, and so that was a, yeah, that was a really, really uh, impactful uh, thing for me. Look, I, I appreciate you being so vulnerable to share that. I, I subscribe to the mindset that facts tell, stories sell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody who's got a testimony and a story that, that somebody who could potentially relate to, that, that speaks uh, and resonates, I think, with people more than just facts. Mm. And so that's kind of why I wanted to dig in there a little bit, just to get to know you a little bit better. And I think that, and of course, keep in mind that like I learned about that from doing this podcast too, that my testimony, while it was supposed to be therapy for me, I realized was medicine for others too, who are reaching out people that I didn't even know that like, Hey, thank you for saying that. I don't feel alone anymore. Mm. I don't feel as ashamed. Mm. Uh, and so, um, I think maybe if somebody who's going through similar situations that you went through, or maybe there's a parent who's got a child who's much like you were at that age, then it, you know, just being told what the facts are of the situation doesn't resonate as much as maybe what the story is and what the outcome was. Agreed. So Agreed. how can and how will the Heartland Premier Charity Golf Classic and the auction that we do the next night at the actual Heartland Premier event at Stony Creek Hotel and Conference Center on June 17th, again, the golf tournament on the 16th, you can get signed up for that golf tournament at some point at heartlandbowhunter.com. How will the money that we raise benefit Peace Partnership? It will benefit us greatly because all of the money that, that people generous people give to us, it goes directly to the services that we provide uh, to clients. So it gets, it goes right back into people in our community uh, that, that we help. One of the things that we do, um, it, we, we basically offer services in two areas. And one of the things that this money is going to go fund is we have partnered with area school districts. We've partnered with the independent school district and we partnered uh, with the blue spring school district. Okay. And we go, we are in five schools. We're in three schools in uh, blue Springs and two schools in the independent school district. And we put counselors in those schools and we partner with them and we basically say to the school counselor and the principal, hey, who are your at-risk kiddos that if they had some help, these are all elementary schools, uh, that if they had some help, these kids would just take off. Mm -hmm. And we identify those kids. We send you know, parent permission slips home. And then we work with those kids once a week for the entire school year free of charge. Wow. Because these kids are in such uh, poverty that they're – they cannot afford to even drive to our office. And so we have to go to them. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, so that's where, uh, that's where a lot of our funding goes uh, is to help our, our school kiddos. I'm scared to ask this question because it may not be fair, but we raised about $23,000 last year for restoration house. Um, now known as rehope. What's, I, I'm hoping to exceed that. <clears throat> and so I'm hoping that by asking this question, it might inspire people to get involved, maybe make a contribution, even if they can't be involved with our invit, get more familiar with your guys' organization, um, peace partnership to maybe make a, a individual personal contribution or donation. Um, let's hypothetically say we do 23,000 again. What does that do? What, like, what, like, do you have a way of scaling it or itemizing it? Like, yeah. what would $23,000 right here, hand it over, what does, what does that do for the organization immediately? 
Well, um, to, like, do you have it? Well, let me ask you this way. Yeah. Do you have an initiative to where you want to get into more schools? Like, do you guys have future goals to where like, Hey, if we had that next extra $23,000, it wouldn't just be this many schools in blue Springs and in grain Valley or wherever. Now we could go in and attack the goal that we had. What are the future goals for peace partnership? So, yeah. So what we would like to do, and right now I am, uh, I'm looking for, a, another therapist, um, to hire okay. so that we can expand not only our, um, in office services, but also are in school services. Uh, our in school services, we've been doing them now for nine years. We've been offering them to schools for nine years and we've grown from one school to five. And I, that's, that's exactly where that money would go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, It would okay. go to grow that because we have schools that are kind of in the queue, so to speak, that our model works. Yeah, It just works. Uh, we measure it on three metrics. We measure it on um, attendance, we measure it on academics and major disciplinary referrals to the office. Okay. And over the nine years we've been doing this, um, the attendance has risen 60% with the kids that we work with. The wow. uh, academics has risen 12%, but we're really not, that's not what we're there for, but mm -hmm. it has risen. Mm -hmm. And the major disciplinary referrals have dropped 44% mm -hmm. wow. with the kids that we work with. And again, like that gets attention sure. of school administrators. And so, that's what we hope to do is to continue to, to grow that. And we're, we're currently in talks. As a matter of fact, next week, I have a, a meeting with the independent school district uh, to, see, to see how we can't grow that, um, that relationship. That's so, great. Yeah. Our average session fee uh, is about 30. I think last year it was about $30. So if that breaks it down for the listeners too, that like, well, how much, you know, how many counseling sessions does $23,000 pay for? Well, divide that by 30 bucks. Okay. So that's hundreds and hundreds of counseling sessions. Sure. Sure. So. No, that's what I was looking for is just to offer some sort of perspective on, you know, how much we could potentially help peace partnership with this event. And, and we're excited to do that. Um, doggone it. Okay. So the last thing I guess I have, unless Jillian, you have anything was just that, you know, mental health, mental illness is at an all time high. Mm. Um, and probably for a lot of different reasons that we don't have time to get into, cause I think you gotta be somewhere at four and it's 20 till. Um, okay. so we got to rush through this, but, um, you know, I guess if somebody who's listening to this, maybe they don't need the help, but they know somebody who does, mm. what is it that, how do they encourage someone to seek you out and, and what's the process of seeking you out? So our website is peacecounseling.org. Okay. You can get a hold of us that way. Um, our phone number is 816-886-0195. Okay. And they call in. You're going to talk to our uh, office coordinator. Her name is Erin. And you're, you'll most likely get Erin, unless she's busy. <laughs> sure. Uh, and you'll get Erin. And Erin then will take some brief um, information, just kind of a, a very broad overview of what's going on in your life. And then what we do is we, we kind of custom fit, uh, people to the counselor okay. because we all specialize. We're not generalists. Mm -hmm. uh, we all specialize in different things. And so different people need different things. And so if you're struggling with a marriage issue, you'll probably go to Regina because Regina, that is her thing. Okay. Um, individual issues. I do a lot of individual work, okay. um, that, that kind of thing. So that's, that's the process. Okay. Um, what if a situ whether there's a situation where like I have a friend who's down on their luck, they're suicidal. Um, I need to get them help. Um, but they're so, you know, uh, that person who needs the help is, is so, what's the word I'm looking for? Confused, you know, just distraught, um, and doesn't have the energy or the capacity to understand that they need the help to call someone. Does do you have the ability to take that call from the friend to say, I've got a friend who needs help. What would you, how would you help navigate someone through that? That would probably be a call. That's a little bit out of our lane. Okay. When they're in that state of crisis. Now, we do work with people who, uh, if they're not in the midst of uh, suicide, uh, okay. or, but, but they, they have some suicidal ideation or they're, mm -hmm. they're thinking about that or they mm -hmm. have thought about that in the past, we absolutely work with those people. But if they're in the midst of that, and if that, let's say on a scale of one to 10, like that's a nine or a 10, like mm -hmm. they've got a plan in place, those types of things, that would be a call to a psychiatric facility. That'd be a call to a psychiatric hospital. Okay, okay fair enough. Yeah. 
Um, I like, I'm just, I'm trying to think outside the box here of ways that we can help people. Um, because most times people who are going through what they're going through either don't want the help. They don't think they need the help or they're too ashamed to ask for the help. Mm. And so how can we get them the help, um, in some way, shape or form, you know, and, and that's ultimately what I'm asking. So suicide, you know, that might've been a little extreme. That certainly makes sense with your answer, but I just want to, I want to give people the information and the resources to put them in a position to when they see something that is wrong, they have the, they have the tools on their belt to help that person yeah. and get that person there. Yeah. And so I was just, just curious if there was, if you ever do get calls where someone says, Hey, I, I, you know, I'm not the person with the problem, but I do have a person with the problem. How can I help them? You bet. D- tell them, um, one of the key differences between adults and children, well, don't tell them this, okay? But, okay. But, um, one of the key differences between adults and children is the issue of advocacy. Okay. You Children cannot advocate for themselves. Adults can. Okay. You have, you have to be willing to pick up the phone and call. We will help you. There is no shame in that. There's nothing that you're, well, I'm mentally ill. No, we, we, do, we just don't see it that way. Okay, but mm-hmm. you you have to be willing to call because there has to be buy in. People have to say, okay, um, I I need help, and if if people can, you know, humble themselves and participate in that, um, that's going to be very very beneficial for them. Thank you so much for being here, man. The, I mean, I want you to come back. You could be like the new, the, the, the uh, Dr. John Thompson to the Papa Ron show could be the, like the Dr. Phil to Oprah. Like, it, I mean, <laughs> really, right. like we could sit right. here and talk about a variety of different take issues and take questions from, in. yes. Yeah, I'd be oh my happy gosh. to do that. That'd be fun, actually. Let's, yeah, let's do so it. Good. Let's not make this the first and last time that you come onto the Papa Ron podcast. Okay. I would love to have you back. It has been so fun talking to you. We're going to make sure that this isn't worth, uh, or we're going to try to make this worth your time. You might remember Brown Piercy Cattle Company is a great sponsor of the Papa Ron podcast. Yeah. And so they have a gift, gift box that they're going to send you. Oh, wow. Four premium thick cut steaks, four of their famous steak burgers, and two family size roasts, along with four pounds of 93% lean ground beef. If, oh, wow. If you think you and Naomi would, Naomi would enjoy that, Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank well, thank you. you for your insight and in, in being vulnerable and telling your story. And we're excited as Heartland Bow Hunter and Heartland Waterfowl uh, make Peace Partnership the beneficiary of the Heartland Premier Charity Golf Classic again, June 16th at Adams Point. Uh, we'll have auction events for a live auction that will follow the next night. June 17th at Stony Creek Hotel and Conference Center. Um, and that is, by the way, absolutely free to get into that premier event. It will cost to get into the golf tournament, and you'll be able to find all that from all that information on heartlandbowhunter.com. This has been a ton of fun. I've really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. Thank I you, appreciate John. it. For Jillian Gregg and Dr. John Thompson from Peace Partnership, I'm Ronnie Phillips. Thanks for listening to episode 34 of the Papa Ron Podcast. You've been listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe now on the podcast platform. Follow the Papa Ron Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And while you're there, like, comment, and share. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast.